All right. Welcome to the LPNY Presidential Debate 2024. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Larry Sharp. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. I'm going to pop my mic up in a second. But the most important reason why we are here, I hope today, is so we can get a better grasp on the candidates who have spent their time, money, and energy trying to push our message forward. We know that in a couple of months here, we're going to have to pick one of them to represent us um, as our presidential candidate. And that's going to matter, obviously, for New York State and also for the nation. So I hope that there will be some insight that we get from them. I want to start letting you know what is the Larry, on. point of order. Yes, please. Uh, Larry, my campaign has recently, just recently, received information uh -oh. about you uh -oh. that I think could directly impact your role as moderator. Please tell me, what is this, what is this information that people don't know about? Well, I think it's important that it be aired out because it could be incorrect. And please. The, the first thing that we have received information on is that you have been serving in some capacity with a super PAC. That, this is accurate. What's the second piece? That is supporting the campaign of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I will absolutely take care of that. Please. What's the second piece? I will, I will cover that. Second piece. And that you have been paid some $30,000 by the super PAC minimum, possibly more. I said I will take care of that. I told them to be about me. What's the next question? I will answer both of those. Next question. It's clear that the interests of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. conflict with the interests of everybody on the stage. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I told you I will answer that question. This should not be about me, it should be about you guys. What is the second piece of information you but, want me to address? I will address all of that. Okay. You said there were two pieces. What is the but, second but piece? But it, it is about you because we're talking about impartiality I, and objectivity. I, I'm going to ask this one more time. Please give me the second I'm piece. I want you to finish speaking so we can finish. I don't want to that's my piece. I'm serious. Stop. Please, what is the second piece? I will cover all of it. Give me the second piece now. The second piece is that we've received information that one of the contenders for the nomination here on the stage, Lars Mapstead, has employed one or two of your companies to advance his presidential campaign and that he has paid you in the neighborhood of some $50,000. Now, clearly, these okay. two conflicts of interest. Let me address them both. Guys, I, I know you want to talk and get it. The reason why I'm cutting off is not because I want to be mean. You guys didn't come here to talk about me. I will answer both of these questions. That's all I'm going to do when I answer those questions. Am I and have I been, in any case, in any way, shape, or form, supporting and or consulting with American Values 2024? Yes. I've been very open about that. I am absolutely consulting with them. What am I consulting with them on? Ballot access. I've been very open about that. Yes, I am. Do I get paid lots of money? Yes, because I'm damn good at what I do. So yes, I get paid lots of money. I do. Yes. Am I on Lars Mapstead's campaign team, particularly when it comes to policy? Yes, I've been very open about that. The, the Voter Bill of Rights, I helped write. That is absolutely correct. If some of you think... It's a good piece of work, by the way. And it is a good piece of work. Thank you very much. Yes. If those people believe, if, it, if people believed, that that somehow made me a bad moderator in some way. You don't have to have me as a moderator. This has been true for literally months. I've told people they do in California for months. I, for months, people have known this. I did this in no way, shape, or form. Yet I've moderated so far, what, six debates, whatever the case may be? If you think that I'm somehow bad, I'm happy. Who's the, where is the chair? Chair? Andrew, would you like me to step down as moderator? No. No, thank you. So I have dealt with these issues. If you guys think it's unfair, please tell me. I've been very open. There's been no hitting, no hiding of anything. Did I answer your question at least? Well, you, you've explained it, but I, I think there's inherent problems with respect to objectivity and bias when you have a, two conflicts of interest. If you believe that to be true, to be full with all of you, then the chair can, if he wants to, remove me, and I'm happy to step down. Otherwise, this debate is going forward. It will now be about you guys, not about me anymore. If you feel that's unfair and you'd like to walk out, I understand. I'd rather you not. I'd like you to stage it if you would. But if you want to protest, I understand. I will not be upset. I challenge the little chair. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. Go on. 
many of us are, have time constraints because we are traveling this afternoon. I would very much like to hear the debate. I Thank very you. much appreciate it. <laughs> Now we're cognizant of them. Let's move on with the debate. There we go. <laughs> so, um, are we good now? We're yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, you said that we all have 60 seconds to start out, but that clock over there says that we have 10 hours and 18 minutes. Uh, I will be timing. I want my 10 hours. I will be timing. Jacob, are we okay? Will you stay? Pardon me? I said, Jacob, are we okay? Will you stay? Why would I not stay? Because you seem to be upset with me as the moderator. I would like no, you to stay. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you have two conflicts of interest, okay. you, it you is got to stay. Also, just stay. Good. On you to I, I, I get it. You're staying. Good. You're staying. You're staying. Disclosure is everything. I just did. Guys, stop. I just disclosed it, didn't I? Yes. Yes. And it was I never hit it in the first place. It literally comes out every, every month. It comes out all the time. You can just see it. Anyone can find it online. I hit it in no way, shape, or form. Wow. Okay. Are we good now? Yes. Awesome. We will start with our 60 seconds. There will be a 60 second opening from each of them. We will then go into a series of questions where they will tell us how they will pitch what they want to pitch. They will have an option on what they want to pitch. Then I will take questions from you that you've already submitted. We'll go back to that again. Then they will actually be able to take questions from you directly, one on one at the end. 60 second close. That's how that will work. 60 second close. Are we good? We'll start with our 60 second opening. Do I have a volunteer? To start? There we go. Dr. Blake, you'll start and we'll go that way. Perfect. Thank you. 60 seconds. We hit start. Uh, I want to say thank you very much to New York. Uh, I appreciate being here. I'd also like to thank all of my colleagues for allowing me on this stage. It's quite an honor uh, to be before you here today. Um, my name is Charlie Ballet. I'm an ear, nose, and throat physician, head neck surgeon from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I've gotten into this race because actually I'm, I'm a bit tired of seeing what's happened to this country. I want my children to grow up in a better place. Um, whether it's taxation, whether it's the environment, whether it's immigration, whether it's medicine, we don't seem to be getting a fair shake in this world right now. We need a different party. The current two-party system is not working for the general public. It has not worked in quite some time, and it's not going to work in the future. I'm tired of looking at politicians and not knowing exactly what it is and how they stand. They're just blowing in which, whichever way the wind blows. And I don't think that's right. And so I, st I stand here before you hoping to influence a few people. And if I could do one doggone thing this, this, this fall, is to try to get more people to run for office. People that actually care about this country that aren't that are not self-interested. So if I so if I ten seconds. Oh, oh then I'll, I'll pass to the next. <laughs> I will get my arm out like this, and you will know you have ten seconds left. Mr. Master, please ten, uh, sixty seconds. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Last night you all heard Larry talk about how money was important in politics, that you couldn't get anything done without money. And I find that to be true. I'm trying to do something different for the Libertarian Party. I'm trying to get us national media attention. And I'm going to do that by focusing on a couple of states and winning electoral votes, causing and denying Trump and Biden the 270 electoral votes needed to win the election, and sending the election to a contingent election under the Constitution where the House of Representatives picks the next president of the United States. This is going to drive national media attention. This is going to get every American to Google what is libertarian because they're going to see the chaos that we have wrecked on the election cycle. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do is really get America to focus because I keep being called a libtard or a MAGA who smokes dope. Please go to Lars24.com to check out my policies and see what I'm all about. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Joseph Collins. I am the I am a media guy. I actually own television stations across the country. Um, I I see the direction of our of our country, and I think that this is the one time in history in which a independent libertarian third party candidate could actually be elected. I feel like in that candidacy, we have to carry the African American vote, we have to carry the Latino vote, 
and we have to carry the Asian vote. And I feel like I'm the person to get that done. I think that we're in a very precarious time. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the Republicans. And I'm tired of the Democrats, you know, and I just think that it's our time now. I think that it's our time. And I think if we come together in unity across our nation, that we can really do something that's never been done before. Thank you. Hello, New York. My name is Chase Oliver. I do want to be the Libertarian candidate for president, and it's because I think that there are enough voters in this country who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if we can get those voters in the tent, we can build our party's foundation up while we tear the state down brick by brick. Now, I've been a candidate for office. I ran for U.S. Senate in Georgia in 2022, and in that race, I forced a runoff between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock, and I earned our party national news and attention all over the country. We got a lot of people seeing a libertarian on their TV screen for the first time in that race, and I know if I can do that in one state, I can do it in all 50. We have an amazing campaign team. We have hundreds of volunteers who are on the ground right now. We're going to be fighting for ballot access in states just like New York. We know how important it is to have a candidate who's on the ballot in all 50 states, because of that, I'm traveling to all 50 states. So libertarians all over the country know there is a libertarian who's running, liberty is on the ballot, and I look forward to talking about our policy as we go forward with this. But if you want to see my policy, go to votechaseoliver.com and join the movement with me. Thank you. Dr. Wall, 60 seconds, please. Good morning, New York. Good morning, friends. I'm Michael Rectumwald, and I'm running for the presidential nomination the Libertarian Party. I'm running because I believe this party needs to be represented by a maximum program for liberty. The strategy of decentralization and the political and philosophical ideal of anarcho-capitalism. This is a campaign not only directed toward these kinds of threats that we already know that impinge on our liberty, like of course the Fed and the alphabet agencies and the military industrial complex, but coming down the pike, climate catastrophism, disease X, and a whole host of other so-called crises that are going to be visited upon us. And we must have somebody who can stand in front of those things and see them in advance, not post hoc criticizing them. This is a campaign for decentralization and radical libertarianism. Thank you. Our job is to lead America to freedom. And that's never going to happen so long as we continue supporting socialism, the very antithesis of freedom. My honorable opponents here support the continuation of social security, the crown jewel of American socialism for the next 25 years. They call it an off-ramp or a tax refund scheme. They also support America's system of immigration controls, which is based on the socialist principle of central planning, which brings crisis, death, and a police state to our nation. We need to restore the sound founding principles of this nation of freedom, free markets, and voluntary charity, including open borders and the immediate repeal of Social Security, Medicare, and every socialist program. We need to stand for what's right. That's what leadership is all about. Are we doing microphones here? Or is that really not necessary? I don't know what the hell I was going to talk about, but I just changed my mind. What Jacob said is actually, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that I adore Jacob Hornberger, and uh, I have been on the record as saying so in every which way possible, it's not true. I'm the guy who's standing here today in front of you saying one of us has the guts to stand up in front of the American people and say that Social Security is evil. It is not a math problem. It is not a problem for which you need to call an economist. It is a values problem. It is a principles problem. I'm the guy that was at the Arizona-Mexico border, and I'm here to tell you it's not a law enforcement problem. It's a values problem. The idea of allowing people to come to the United States and then sending them into indentured servitude, human trafficking. This is a values problem. The reason that we're going to be successful in this campaign is not because we're good at math. It's not because we're able to do the calculation that suggests we shouldn't be spending so much money in Ukraine. 
It's because the American people have values that better align with ours than with those two stupid parties in Washington. Thanks a lot. you are able to get on TV. And you can either get on Fox News or MSNBC. You will tell me which one you want to go on, and you are able to take 90 seconds to explain what you think about one of the, these three issues, domestic issues, inflation, immigration, crime slash gun violence. So either inflation, immigration, or crime slash gun violence. And you will pick either MSNBC or Fox. You ask your question, and I will push back as the host of one of those shows, and you will then rebut to whatever ever my pushback is. You understand what I'm asking you? I'm asking two things. Pick which one you're on, Fox or MSNBC, your choice, and then pick a topic, either inflation, immigration, or crime slash gun violence. Either one, and give me 90 seconds on that topic of your choice. Do I have a volunteer who wants to go first? Dr. Merkel, you'll go first. We'll come back this way towards Chase. Go ahead, Darrell. You have 90 seconds to do this. Okay, so where I'm, are you? I'm, I'm going to go on to MSNBC. MSNBC. I've been on Fox like 15 times, okay, so, so I, I'm not sure I'm going to go back there. MSNBC, and what is the topic? I, I'll take the topic of crime and gun violence Perfect. for 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I, what I would say to MSNBC is I'd go on there and I'd be brought on, you know, as the Libertarian nominee. And uh, they would be, you know, probably trying to <clears throat> think that I would erode the uh, support for Donald Trump. So this is the establishment trying to push uh, against their, uh, you know, their nemesis. So <clears throat> I would go on there and I would say, look, you support the, uh, the you're against the war in uh, Israel. You do not want the U.S. sending arms and funds to Israel. But you're all down with the uh, Ukrainian war for the most part. This is where the left establishment sits. And I would point out the principle that they actually violate in this, in this support. And so it is, it is necessary to know where these people are coming from. I, I used to go on MSNBC uh, weekly, actually, and uh, I know where they're coming from, and I know how to uh, undermine and attack their premises. Thank you. Um, host, I'm going to say, Dr. Rechtewald, why won't you, why won't you admit that assault weapons are killing our children? Why do you want assault weapons to kill our children? Why are you doing that? Yeah, so you notice how I deflected from the question and turned it into the U.S. military use of arms, which is the gravest concern that faces our country, not, not and the world at large. So let's get that straight. Who's the biggest perpetrator of murder and crime? The, the state. Let's, let's clarify matters right off the top. And then I would go into uh, the issues of gun violence, which I think are created by making drugs and other things, in, uh, pushing them into the black market and creating criminal gangs in order to vend them. Once that is eliminated, all of that would go away. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go on Fox News, and I'm going to talk about inflation. Got it. 90 seconds, please. Yeah, so I want to remind the Fox News audience, many of you who probably want to vote for Donald Trump, to remind, to remind yourselves that uh, two things. One, Donald Trump blew up our debt and deficit more than any other president in a single year during the COVID lockdown years, and because of that, he devalued your dollar through inflation. But let's talk about the real problem with the Republican Party. The fact that the last time you had a candidate who said he wanted to end the Fed, you did, you did everything you could to silence him, both on the campaign trail and at the convention. That guy's name was Ron Paul. And so I don't think any Republican should ever have any faith that they're going to do anything to stop inflation, because if anything, they are Democrats with uh, the safety brakes on. And so they're going to increase inflation just as much as Democrats, and uh, there's no damn thing Trump's going to do about it. Okay. As the Fox News host, I'm going to push back. So what you're saying is, you want Biden to win. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm 
I'm saying is I want the American people to win, and they only do that by rejecting both the Democrats and Republicans who have been causing the inflation in your life. The inflation that you're feeling is a hidden tax that's caused by the two-party system. It affects you whether that money's in your pocket, your bank account, or your business. The American people deserve better. They deserve someone who's going to balance the budget, fight and end the Fed, and actually bring our monetary policy back to some sort of sanity. Because if they don't do it, we're going to continue being robbed every single day by our government without any kind of permission or consent. That's what inflation is. It's robbery. Yeah. I do want to add, by the way, that each of the candidates, they do have five orange chips that they may use to rebut anything at any time if they want to. They just put it up and say, hey, I'm going to say something if they want to for 45 seconds. Up to them if they like. Um, now if I go to uh, Mr. Collins, please, where are you and what topic? Does that mean you only have five? five. You only have five rebuts. That's correct. You have five rebuts. That's correct. Period. That's correct. Yes. That's correct. Could you ask a question? Absolutely. What station are you on, MSNBC or Fox? And what topic are you speaking about? Inflation, immigration, or crime slash gun violence? So, um, which one has a better lighting? <laughs> you pick. <laughs> you tell me. Uh, I would definitely. Um, put, the, put the mic. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. So which one? Um, you I would. I would go on MSNBC, and, MSNBC. And, I, and, I would, and I would talk about gun violence. Good. MSNBC gun violence. Ninety seconds. Go. Sure. So, um, gun violence, specifically in urban areas, is, is just gotten out of hand. You have places like Chicago. You have places like St. Louis, in which there's like a murder almost every every second there. And I think that we have to address gun violence on our streets. I, I'm one of those that I have a gun, and I am for. Um, the Second Amendment rights, I think that you should have a gun to protect yourself and protect your household. Um, but when you see some of the things that are going on in urban America, these things are very devastating to the community. It, 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 it hurts the, the economic base in the community. It, it provides fear so that people don't want to move in the community. It brings down real estate values in the community. And I just think that we now have to take a very hard look at urban America and really say, you know, what do we have to do to fix our urban cities? And this is going on all across, all across America. It's 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 really bad in, in urban spaces, and we have to address gun violence and, and make gun violence and pass legislation that can help stop the violence in our community. Excellent, thank you. And that's my pushback. Oh, so please, okay. yes. <laughs> but don't you understand that the reason why there is violence in the poor communities is because of systemic racism? That is the reason why there is violence. And you have to understand that. So of course you must pass things for more, obviously more equity, and also of course, gun control. Isn't that true? Your, your legislation is for equity and gun control, correct? No, I, I, my, my legislation is for improvement in urban spaces, period. It's not just equity and gun control, it's, it's, it's urban life, it's, it's education. It's, it's our little children being afraid to walk down the streets and go to school. It's the schools themselves. It's, it's a big fix in these spaces. It's economics, it's education. It's a big fix in these spaces. Thank you. What station are you on and what are you speaking about? I'm gonna go MSNBC and inflation. Okay. 90 seconds, go. Thank you. Everybody in America is struggling right now. It doesn't matter what uh, economic situation you come from. People, some people are struggling a lot more than others. People are struggling to choose between their rent and their health care. They're trying to figure out whether they can buy a steak tonight or they have to you know, settle with some cereal or some top ramen. Inflation is killing America. And unfortunately, the media and the government have sold you propaganda and gaslighting. They told you that inflation was because of the evil corporations. And a lot of people want to believe that. But the truth is, inflation is because of the banking cartel and the Federal Reserve and the Congress, who grants favors to the rich and the powerful through the tax code. <clears throat> we need to rein in inflation, and how we do that is we have to cancel the bank's credit cards. We have to rein in the Fed and the Fed and stop the endless printing of money and the endless theft of your standard of living each and every day. It's built in into their mandate of 2% inflation. 
It's guaranteed that your dollar is going to be worth less tomorrow than it is today. If we had inflation as a tax, there would be riots in the street in America, but because people are financially illiterate, they don't understand what is going on with this uh, in endless theft of our money. Uh, and so we need to bring that in. I, I also want to talk about abolishing the IRS, because taxation is, of course, theft. And we need to uh, thank you. We, we need to abolish the IRS and stop the theft, allowing citizens to keep 100% of their paycheck. So look, obviously, I think it's very common from you crazy right-wingers. Clearly, this is the reality of it is, is greedy corporations, we have data on this, greedy corporations are taking all the profits and guys like you and Trump want tax cuts for the rich. Isn't that true? I want tax cuts for everybody because the thing is, is that we should all be allowed to keep 100% of our paycheck. As a person who has worked in uh, you know, retail, who has worked in food service, who has cleaned up grease traps, I know what it's like to live on top ramen from days on end. And I want every American to be able to have a better standard of living. We deserve a better standard of living. And our government is robbing the standard of living from us. Dr. Belay, where are you and what are you speaking to? I'd like to speak to MSNBC because I think it's going to be a harder, harder audience to actually pull over uh, uh, to our side, right? Um, I'd like to talk about crime and drug violence. So I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans has a, it, it's, it is a very poor city. It's a fun city, but it's a poor city. If I was a black youth, particularly a black male in that city, I would be scared to live there. And that is appalling in the United States of America, right? So we have a lack of education down there. The Department of Education, our educational department is horrid. It's a board, right? You have to go to a private school, in which case family has to spend a good portion of their salary in order to put their child through an education Yet, they're still taxed. We're all still taxed, right? Now, there's also a loss of family values in this country. Where's, where's the family? We're, we're supposed to be holding to God, to our family, and our country. Our God is now being crushed. Our, our, our family's being crushed. And so we're left beholden to our country. There's something truly wrong with that. There's also, uh, well, a problem with the drug in this country. Disproportionately, African-American people of color are actually being put into prisons, being, being chastised, being taken away from their families as a consequence of this. We've lost the war on drugs. You could probably walk down the street here and buy crack or heroin or whatever the heck you want. And it's not working. So well, how do we fix this, right? Do we, do, do we basically continue on as we, are, as we are because it doesn't seem to be functioning well in this country? Or do we actually treat this more as a, as a problem with someone's health and say, listen, we can give you help, right? There's no reason to act like this way. We can bring families back together. We can bring them back to church. We can bring back the things that do not require violence or keeping people down. Yes, sir. What I'm actually saying is that we do need more funding for schools. So obviously, yeah. if we were to tax the rich, we could put more money into schooling, public schools, because these obviously these kids, they're in public schools, they need public schools, more funding would be the answer. Absolutely not. No. The Department of Education, the, the schools that function in New Orleans are, are lean. They, these are parents that care. They send their children to the schools because, because they want their children to have a better education. They don't want persons to learn a woke mentality without, without skills that can get them through life. The children should be able to compete. Once they get to a certain uh, grade level, they should actually be able to choose how he or she wants to act and what he or she wants to do in life. And right now, with the math skills, you just don't have it in this country. I'm with my uh, other friends here as a panel on the Joy Reid show. I like and that. Uh, this is a new look for you, by the way. You, you look good, Joy. Uh, and uh, as we are uh, discussing crime, I'd like to, to weigh in. As a former police officer, one of the things that I learned that you learned is that if you were not a professional economist before becoming a cop, becoming a cop will turn you into an economist. The truth of the matter is that being a cop allows you to see up close and personal in a way that you actually care about. It allows you to see bad public policy in action. We have learned that the, the, the cocktail of bad, public, bad schools, bad welfare policy, bad zoning policy, bad housing policy. Did I say bad school policy? Let me say bad school policy again. This group this, this evil concoction that we have imposed on these communities has destroyed families, it's destroyed individual lives, it's ripped apart entire communities. And for what? We know 
that intergenerational poverty is not something that would be predicted from free markets. It is the result of bad public policy. And it's up to us to get bad public policy out of our communities. So what I didn't hear was the most important thing that's killing our children, which is guns. Guns are killing more of our children than anything else. It's the number one reason why kids are dying in America right now. Why will you not just say gun control is the answer? Gun control is not the answer. We know empirically it doesn't work, and it's ethically uh, untenable. We also know that it, it's, it's just not true. It is the vehicle that so many uh, Americans are choosing to propagate violence. But violence is not a problem of what it is that's in your hand. It's a problem of what it is that's in your head. We need to bring down crime rates. We live under the world's most oppressive criminal justice system already. So criminalizing more stuff is not going to help us get out of this. And as long as we're here on your panel, Joy. Oh, there we go. Three yeah. more seconds. Go. Well, I, I thought I would mention that we do have a problem. I'm glad my fellow panelists brought up the idea that we have so much inflation going on in the United States. We have seen Democrats come and go. We've seen Republicans come and go. And what have we learned? There is no political solution to inflation other than fundamentally changing how we conduct policy in the United States. We need a fundamental, profound change. We need to end the Federal Reserve System to shore up our dollar and our economy. That will help our communities as well as our national economy. Thanks a lot. Mr. Hochberger, where are you and what are you speaking about? Um, I'm going to speak at Fox News okay. and on immigration. Excellent. You right-wingers, led by your standard bearer, Donald Trump, preach free markets, and then you end up supporting a socialist system of immigration controls that has brought nothing but death, suffering, a Berlin Wall, and concertina wire to our nation. Your hypocrisy is as bad as the Democrats led by their standard bearer, Joe Biden, who preach that they love the poor, needy, and disadvantaged whenever we libertarians call for the dismantling of these socialist welfare state programs. And look what you all have done to the poor of this nation with your system of immigration controls. <laughs> we libertarians stand for the principles in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's where we want to lead America. We're sick and tired of the death and the suffering. Eighty years. I grew up on the border. I spent 30 years of my life there. The Border Patrol trespassing onto our farm without a warrant. Highway checkpoints. That's what you right-wingers have brought and the left-wingers have brought to our nation. And we libertarians are going to lead America out of this morass and we're going to lead the world to the highest reaches of freedom that mankind has ever seen. <clears throat> we're going to restore life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness not only to the American people, but to the people of the world. If you're not going to have borders, we are America. Why are you going to have a country? You got to have borders, don't you? You absolutely have to have borders. But the fact that people are free to cross borders doesn't mean that borders disappear. The border remains intact. I drove here from uh, from Massachusetts. I crossed borders. I never initiated force against anyone. Neither did my fellow travelers. We didn't violate rights. Those borders remain. The fact that people are free to cross borders and pursue happiness, get jobs, seek uh, their own lot in life, does not mean that the nation disappears. We had open borders in this country for more than 100 years. The nation stood, and it was a vital nation that led the world. Sean, 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 thanks for having us on the Hannity Show. What my fellow panelist means is that we're not angry with conservatives. We get, I used to be a Republican myself. I used to be a Republican myself. Let me reset that. The truth is that we all recognize that immigration is good for the United States. We want more immigration, but we want it done responsibly. Americans demand vetting at the border. I get that. But with the right technology in place, we can vet people across fast. What's really critical 
is we stop creating a black market for illegal immigration because that's what's so dangerous. It's what leads people into indentured servitude. It's what leads to human trafficking, to death, despair, crappy wage rates because corporations take advantage of these folks. We can work together. Thanks, Sean. Let's keep something in mind on immigration controls. There's no reform plan that's going to make this system work. Number two, these are controls on us. When you go outside this country to Co Cancun or Cozumel and you come back and they say drop your trousers and your underwear and bend over because we're going to we're going to check your body cavities or lift your dress and drop your underwear. You have to follow those orders because you forfeit your rights when you leave this country for an hour. When you cross the border to Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, next to my hometown of Laredo, you come back, you are subject to giving your, your uh, cell phones and your, your laptops now. You have to divulge your, your passwords. If not, you stay in jail. Is that 10 seconds or is that the end? That's five seconds. Five seconds. That's immigration controls, not only on foreigners, but on us as American people. So one of the big problems that we have with the border is actually the 50-year failed war on drugs. The 50-year failed war on drugs cartel south of the border, and the cartels are now human trafficking. We've got to stop this. I don't want to see moms and children crawling under Constantine wire. I don't want to see children separated from their families anymore. I don't think that that's what Americans want. We need to end the chaos at the border, get the border under control so that we can actually have a, a movement of people to come in and work and be part of this uh, American dream that we all have been benefited of so that we can all raise our standard of living. We need immigration in order to keep our economy going. Uh, and so, yeah, we need to end the failed war on drugs, period. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, this, this immigration uh, crisis is, not, is only going to be solved by second best solutions under the existing con conditions in which we have a state. That being said, the state, it open borders is state control of public property. That's what it really amounts to. So the question is, who should control public, pro uh, public property? Uh, and the, the answer is the people who pay for it. So my, my immigration policy is a little different, and in fact, cuts across this in terms of property rights. So what I would recommend is that we have immigration by invitation, and this is not draconian. This can be very liberal, per se and also uh, people oh, right. that would pay liability insurance for that. You can do another 45 seconds if you want to keep going. You want to do no. another 45? Okay, thank you. You know, uh, I think <clears throat> first, uh, one of our panelists said that we shouldn't be upset at conservatives. We should, but we should be upset at Republicans and Democrats because this immigration crisis has been existing for decades and all they do is fundraise off of it. They never want to solve this issue because if they did, they would have nothing to run on. So we need to remember that. When the two-party system talks about immigration, they just want to keep it going, going, and going. But I think we need to return back to Ellis Island immigration. Uh, one or four out of every 10 people in this country, four out of every 10 people in this room can probably have a relative who came through the register room at Ellis Island. If we return back to a system like that, when we had the greatest influx of immigrants, and we built up the greatest uh, middle class we've ever had in this country, that's something we can do. Immigrants contribute to this country, they help build this country, and we need to st stop letting Republicans demonize them and Democrats take advantage and just continue to fight and not solving the issue. Chase said uh, everything's so good. There we go. Okay. Just got man. <laughs> there we go. That worked out. All right. Uh, everyone's doing that? Great. Who did we start that question on? That was. Uh, oh, no. Correct. No, 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 that was the last answer. Right? That, 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 that was you. Oh, uh, right, that was yeah. That was actually, yeah, that was you, Mr. Mott. That, that's what we said, right? Yes? Yes. We all answered the Fox News or MSNBC question. There we go, yes. Okay, so everyone, everyone did it, right? We went down the line? Yeah. 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 Anybody missed it? Okay, awesome. Now, what I want you all to do is think about a, uh, an answer that one of the panelists gave. 
Think about an answer that one of the panelists gave. When you think about that answer, please tell me what you think could have been better about that answer. What would be a better way or another way of handling that answer? So think about what someone said and then what would be a better way of doing it. That person then will have a rebuttal on that. So 60 seconds to say what you think could have been better and then 30 seconds for that person to rebut to that. Dr. Lee, you want to start? Sure. Please go ahead. I'm not picking on Jaden because I like him a lot um, and I respect his values. <laughs> but uh, but I think if you're going to have an open border policy, I think you really need to take the United States for what it is right now. So you're coming up from Honduras, right? You're going to come in the United States and you may get a job. And I guess this hits home because when I was in the Texas Hill Country, you'd see contractors go to Home Depot and say, come on, get back the truck. Everybody get back the truck, they work a day's pay and they say, screw you, I'm not paying you. There was no recourse they could take, right? What could they do? They had, they had, they had nothing. If they could report them, they basically get thrown right out of the country. That's a true story. Um, and uh, and so I think before you say let's bring everybody across the border, there has to be some means by which not only that these persons would be able to have 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 some means to help our society and not receive 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 social services, which needs to be fixed, right? But they also have some recourse should they get screwed in this country by by bad players. Yeah, the, the, the reason that people get abused by this system is because of the system. When they don't get paid, when employers don't uh, pay them, they know that the, that the employee can't do anything because he's here illegal. And when, when you've got a system of open borders, it's the same system we have here domestically with open borders. People are free to cross back and forth. They keep their citizenship. And if they get a job and somebody screws them, they can sue. They, they don't have to worry about that. And we're not talking about bringing people in. We're talking about freedom. The freedom of people simply to cross back and forth across borders. Totally different concept than bringing. Thank you. Let's get someone, uh, some question that you think you could have been answered better in some way. Please go ahead, 60 seconds. Okay, thank you so much. I think everybody up here had, is within 5% of each other on almost every issue. You can't get too far out of the Overton window in the Libertarian Party before your head gets chopped off. Uh, so, but I, I think, um, I like what Dr. Blay said, but I think I would add a little bit on immigration. Um, you know, it's, we, we all came here from somewhere, and we all wanted a better life. Our grandparents, our great-grandparents, I have Swedish immigrants, I have Australian immigrants, I got people from all over the place, and we wanted a better life. And a lot of the people coming here want a better life than where they're fleeing from. And they're often fleeing because the cartels are making the countries that they live in untenable and unsafe to live in. And so if we end this failed war on drugs, the people of those countries would probably, a lot of them would just stay there because no one really wants to leave their home and their friends and their families. They leave under duress. They leave under economic duress, seeking a better life. And that's what all my ancestors did. And I want to allow that opportunity for anybody in the world to come and have a better life if they so choose and be a part of America. Um, I agree with Lars. I, mean, I just think uh, in this country, when you see persons coming across the border, um, and, and I, I'm a, a huge proponent, I, 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 if I had to pick a society I love, I love the Hispanic people. I lived in South Texas for a while, absolutely. They had hardworking, just family values, just very, for the most part, very good people. But when you see um, social services being offered, you come in, you can have all the health care, etc. Um, it's too much of a lantern to go towards. It's like a, a light. Um, I think we need to fix society here. Um, and so that makes it equitable for everyone. Thank you. I want to speak to this because we hear this all the time when we talk about immigration. We have to stop the welfare state first. We can't be open borders. We can't support free movement of people 
I'm sorry. Our principles as a libertarian party is to support the right of free people without constraint. Just because the government does something, aka a welfare state, shouldn't change our principles any more than saying, well, there's lots of gun violence in the streets. We have to, we have, we have to compromise on our gun rights position to stop all these gun deaths in the streets. No, we don't. We have to articulate our position and articulate the position that we want to crush the welfare state piece by piece at the exact same time. We libertarians should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time with policy. Please, one person, uh, what they said, what you think could have been better or changed. I think um, Mike's quote on bad public policy as it comes to policing is something that, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's odd to me that he would even say that because his job was not to um, make bad public policy. His job was to enforce bad public policy. And so if you're enforcing bad public policy on policies against people, and I don't know where he served as his police term or whatever, but uh, I, I do know that from a different point of view, how that policy does affect um, the people who are now, in, uh, who are now the, the victims of bad public policy. I do understand how that's affected um, from every point of view. And policing is one of the, biggest things that we face in the urban communities to this day. Believe me when I tell you that. And that's why when I become president, I will reform the criminal justice system so that it's fair for everyone. Everyone has a chance at the law. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. As I said just a few minutes ago, we live under the world's most oppressive criminal justice system. It absolutely needs to be reformed beginning with ending the war on drugs. It is also the reason I spend so much time talking about profound reform of the way that we manage police officers and the way that we manage police agencies. Having said that, the cocktail of bad public policy is well outside the realm of police work when we talk about what it is that's affecting our communities. Yes, oppressive criminal justice, but also bad housing, bad zoning, and arguably most important, bad education policy. So, with criminal justice, we're talking about criminal justice system, and, and to me, a couple of the reforms that are desperately needed is ending qualified immunity and ending civil asset forfeiture, because we should not be incentivizing the police to shake us down every time we drive our car down the road. That is ridiculous, right? Uh, also, I'm a big uh, a proponent of ending um, <laughs> the, the, when, you, when you get... Um, Plea bargaining, sorry. Plea bargaining is really bad. And uh, and we need to allow people to have their day in court and to be held uh, with that because plea bargaining basically gives a, a rein to the government to just completely run over your rights and we need to get that. I want to give triple damages to anybody who is found innocent by the government uh, when they are when they're proven innocent. Thank you. The reason qualified immunity is so dangerous is because it does a couple of things. Number one, it sends the signal to Americans that you can't seek redress in court when you believe that you've been wronged by a police agency or a police officer. That is fundamentally un-American. We need to end qualified immunity also so that we get a requirement that officers carry their own liability insurance, just like doctors, just like doctors have to carry their own malpractice insurance. And this way we invite in a third party private sector check on the system. Because we all know that an insurance company, in order to provide you your liability insurance, they're not going to put up the bullshit of the police unions stymieing them from getting the information they need. So it's a, it's a piece of overall reform. Thank you. Again, I, 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 I say this again, specifically from policing to where we are now. When you go to court, 
the courts are based on the expense of the attorney that you could that you can qualify for. And most people in urban spaces are, don't have the luxury of qualifying for an attorney that can help them interpretate, interpret the law in such a way that they can uh, use the law to vindicate themselves. And what has happened is, is that there is these extreme misuses of the law, the misinterpretations of the law. And so when you talk about a bad public policy, you're really talking about the use of the law from the words of, from the, from the world of these uns unscrupulous attorneys. So as I said. Excellent. So now up to Mr. Oliver, is that correct? Yes. Yes, Mr. Oliver, please. One person and what you thought could have been better or different. So uh, the, the, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you, Chips, but I think uh, your response, you know, to the, to the media question there uh, needed a little bit more clarification. You know, we need a little more fine tuning there. So you, I, I understand you said you wanted to support education in our inner cities, you want to support you know, ending violence in our inner cities, but we have to articulate what's going to cause that. What's going to improve education in our inner cities? Getting the government out of education, letting parents have more agency of where their kids go to schools, and creating an education marketplace in our inner cities. What's going to end crime in our cities? First off, ending the war on drugs and the over criminalization of our society, these crimes without victims that allow police to come into our neighborhoods and over police our neighborhoods and our inner cities, those who are poor and people of color who, can't, uh, who, who are most under the boot of government. We have to articulate the fact that our war on drugs and the justice system itself is systemically racist when you look at the disparity when it comes to sentencing, when it looks at the disparity when it comes to where cops are and who they're, and who they're arresting. <clears throat> Trust me, I believe there are criminals in our inner cities, but I believe there are greater criminals in the corporate halls of power in this country that rob each and every one of us blind, and they never go to jail for it. They never have a police state pushing down on them. It's just the poor and those who can't afford to fight back. I mean, I think by and large, my, my colleagues or my colleague has a different interpretation of what the war on drugs actually is. The war on drugs is actually an economically disadvantaged community. There are no jobs, there's no economics, there's nothing that are going on in these communities and they're trying to make a living the best way that they can. Do I agree with that? Absolutely I do not. But have I seen it and understand it? I 100% have seen it, I 100% understand it. So we have to bring an economy back to these spaces, understood, we have to bring an economy back to these spaces that it doesn't exist. Uh, I would echo this. I mean, so in, uh, going back to where I'm from, um, these poor youth have no opportunity. They have no hope. I mean, these, these kids are growing up and what they know around their two blocks um, that's what they have, and that's what they have to look forward to. Um, if you don't have anything to look forward to, and you don't have opportunity in front of you, um, why would you not go in directions that you would not choose should you have been afforded what we all have here? We're all done pretty well in life. We're sitting in this place. We had fantastic breakfast this morning, fantastic dinner last night, but unfortunately many of these kids don't even have that opportunity. Um, and until we start bringing jobs back to this country and start manufacturing things in this country and start being back once we once were prior to ceding our authority to the rest of the world, these kids aren't going to have the hope. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. We are now down to, uh, is it Dr. Ritter Rectowall? Please, 60 seconds, please. Sure. Uh, so the uh, immigration issue, let's just touch on that and then go on to the other one, uh, the crime issue and the... Uh, which person are you talking about there? Oh, everybody. <laughs> oh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm very generous in the distribution of my uh, everything. <laughs> so let me just say this. What I, what I argue here now is that not only is the immigration being caused by the war on drugs, by foreign intervention, by the United States government, and so on, but I got to tell you the truth. It's being artificially induced. Uh, with handouts, with, with uh, social uh, welfare payments. Uh, there are, in the last uh, two years alone, the Office for uh, Refugee Resettlement received $2 billion, or I'm sorry, they distributed $2 billion to an NGO to pass out uh, social welfare to incoming immigrants. So this is artificial induction, an artificial stimulation of a market factor. That's, that's the way I would treat it, and that, that has to stop. And does that stop this immigration? Is that the same thing as doing two things at once? It does two things at once. Thank you. Here we go. Anybody want to that since you are all wrong? I'm going to use my turn to 
flag Michael, so he'll get no chance to speak if that helps. No, does anybody want to respond to the 30 seconds? Awesome. Uh, good, Mr. Holmberger, uh, you have six seconds to pick one person. I'll pick Chase Oliver. Okay. Uh, Chase has made a big point of immigration that he favors the Ellis Island kind of system. I totally oppose the Ellis Island kind of system because it vests government with the power to control the free movements of people, including American people. At Ellis Island, they would line up women immigrants, a panel of 10 men, and require them to remove their blouses and their bras so they could inspect their, inspect their breasts for disease. Yeah, right. And then when that, when you vest government with control, that leads to the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s. That once you vest government with power, they're going to exercise that power. Then that leads to excluding German Jews. Hitler was willing to let Jews leave Germany in the 1930s, and Roosevelt says, we have the power to control immigration, which is vested back in them with this Ellis Island kind of system. And that was America's contribution to the Holocaust. That's why freedom means you don't vest government with these powers. Freedom means people have the right to pursue happiness in their own way by crossing borders and entering countries freely. So first, let me just clear something up. When I say Ellis Island model, it is a catch-all for saying that all I require for people to come to this country is declare who they are so they can go through a basic background check. I don't believe in quotas. I don't believe in the ripping of blouses and that sort of stuff. All I say is that if you want to come through a port of entry, declare who you are because we do have extradition treaties that we exercise with all the nations around the world. And if someone's coming in who is escaping from another nation who is uh, who requires us to extradite our treaty, we should do that because we would want those other nations to do the same if a murderer was escaping the United States south of our border. And so that's all I'm asking is a basic criminal background check, which unlike Ellis Island would have taken a long time in the 1900s, but in the 21st century you can do almost instantly. Uh, I want to bring up what Michael had said earlier, for a couple different reasons. I want to bring up what Michael said about immigration earlier. For one reason, I want to give him another 45 seconds to make his case, because I think he's got a really interesting idea. I just happen not to like it. The idea is that we use the border uh, to close people out, unless they have someone inviting them in, right? I'm not a fan of, as Jacob would put it, vesting the government with all this power, unless, of course, I can invite in the entire nation of Cuba. Then, then we've got a deal, right? Because I wouldn't mind doing that. I think it also needs to be said that there's another elephant in the room. Uh, we have all recently learned from local news that there is in New York State a contractor who has won a $500 million no-bid contract to help shepherd immigrants around New York State and to place them in places with which they're unfamiliar, the communities are not ready to support them, and uh, for which the immigrants have no reason to remain and no resources to help them out. We need to get the government out of this completely. We can't have the government moving people around and landing them in communities. We need this to be a market process. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'm actually recommending is the privatization of immigration. This is entirely different than state-controlled immigration. Allowing people to invite others to come to their property and to work or live or what have you. This is not, this is a property rights issue. Who controls public property and what? Uh, the state controls it. I believe it controls it illegitimately. So I think the best solution is to offer a, uh, the citizens, the taxpayers, some actual say and who immigrates and how. And this is through an invitation system. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, I really like this idea. So I want to work with you here. But if someone doesn't get the invitation, right, this is where I got the problem. If you can't get the invitation from an American already here, the government is going to, I assume, under your plan, the government is going to tell me I can't commit at all. That's where I have the problem. It's a lovely idea that, you know, maybe you get to go to the front of the line or you have reduced vetting or you have some, you know, expenses are paid for you. If you have, you know, an uncle or someone willing to sponsor you on the inside of the United States, that's, that's really lovely. The problem is if you don't have that, 
we're all of a sudden discriminating against people who we want to come into the United States. Do you want to use your 45 seconds? Yeah, I'll use it now. Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is not some draconian, illiberal uh, package that I'm recommending. This is actually very uh, humanitarian, and it's also extremely private. It privatizes immigration. And so it doesn't mean you have to get a piece of paper that says, so-and-so, you have been invited. This can be done in many different ways. It could be done with a company saying, we, I want to sponsor X amount of people from so, such and such a place or what have you. Or people bringing in their, uh, their friends and relatives and, uh, and loved ones and so forth. So this is not about the state enlarging its role. Right now the state is not only pretending to uh, mind the border, but it is inducing immigration with social welfare payouts. Yeah, I want to amplify on, on Michael Rechtenwald's answer here on immigration because in Chronicles Magazine, which is a right-wing rag, he wrote that he wanted to seal the border and complete Donald Trump's wall. He has also called for border controls among the states. In other words, each state is going to have controls on who comes into the state from the other states. I mean, if you, if you like the police state along the border, Highway checkpoints, warrantless searches, criminalization of hiring, transporting, etc. immigrants. Imagine a 50-state network of border patrols, of highway checkpoints. That's what he favors. His, his prince, he's, he, he, he's consistent. He wants to co continue it all through the nation. I would also just invite you to see the new flyer we have. This is the future. Open borders. Here are four books that I would highly recommend. Another 45 seconds. Thank you. All right. So you have a chance to read. Can you use 45 seconds? You can. Do I have to throw a tip? Yes. Of course. You can throw the other one. Yes. No, I'll skip it. I think that's not right. No good. All good. No worries. Absolutely. So everyone got to talk, right? Excellent. Did you guys like that back and forth? I made this so you understand is it allows the candidates to decide what's important to them. They can tell you what they think is most important. They can step in when they feel it's valuable. I hope you get more from the candidates by this thought versus me just controlling what they answer and how they answer. I'm going to go to the next piece if I could. And this is some questions that you guys gave to me. And um, do I have a volunteer who wants to start? E Excellent. Mr. Oliver, you will start. You'll come towards me. This question is very specific to New York State. New York State petitioning would be very expensive. Will you commit today to financially supporting New York petitioning from April 16th to May 28th? And if so, to what extent? Oh. Uh, one minute. So I understand it's going to be expensive. Now, I am not working full time right now. But what I can do is I can put my feet to the ground and go knock on doors, which I've committed to doing in every single state that requires ballot access. And New York is no different. I also have 300 volunteers and growing on my team right now, and we're looking to see who can travel into New York for a weekend, for just a day if they have to, and spend the maximum amount of time here in New York to get us on the ballot. It's why I'm traveling to all 50 states, because I believe we need to be a 50-state party. It's one of the things that distinguishes us. We've had six presidential campaigns where we've been on the ballot in all 50 states. No other third party can say that, and I think it's vitally important for us to maintain that. So anything I can do, short of any money, because I make like 200 bucks a week at this point, but short of that, I'm going to be out here fighting for New York and fighting for libertarians on the ballot because it's important that we challenge the two-party system 100%. Collins, same question. It, being on the ballot is like one of the most crucial things uh, across the nation, specifically in, um, in, in great states like Indiana and New York. Those types of places like that, we have to be on the ballot. I'm willing to support any effort that we can support to to get on the ballot. I, I don't know how much it takes, but I guess um, I was just informed by Lars it's about 45,000 signatures, so that's um, 300,000, uh, roughly two, three hundred thousand dollars on average in order to get that done, possibly in New York. And you know, I have a friend here earlier that says going to write me a check for a million dollars, so we will just use that. <laughs> no, just kidding. We, um, you know, we, we we can get this done. We're going to have to get this done so that we are viable throughout the nation. We can get this done, but we have to do it as a team and as a nation. I mean, as a, as a, as a party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you. Ballot access is the crucial piece to our party. We cannot affect any change unless we get ballot access. We cannot even run the race until we can get ballot access. I have been on the ground. Part of my plan is to win Maine, an electoral vote in Maine. So I went there and I said, hey, I want to get on the ballot. And they said, we don't have ballot access. We got removed from the state altogether. And uh, Bill Redpath and Richard Winger and I got together with the chair of Maine. We put together, I put in $25,000 of my own money. Uh, the other guys put in money, and we were able to push over the line major party status for Maine. I want to help do the same thing for, for New York. Obviously, it's a huge challenge. We also have Illinois, which is also a huge challenge. But this is the critical piece. This is the most important piece, in my opinion, because we cannot affect change that we want. We cannot get freedom if we cannot get on the damn ballot. I have put together a piece of policy to unrig the system called the Voter's Bill of Rights, which details and directs this exact thing. We have to focus on ballot access. It is critical. Thank you. Absolutely, I'm being completely frank. Um, I, will, I can contribute to the to the amount that our our, our, our uh, campaign can afford. Uh, we were trying to run a campaign and fly here, there, and everywhere. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you we can contribute thousands upon thousands of dollars because I can't. I mean, I'm financing this primarily with my own dollars, right? I do believe in ballot access, absolutely. I mean, I'm from Louisiana, where it's actually quite fair. You guys are are in a in a real pickle up here, and that's a shame. Without getting on the ballot, you can't you, you can't do much of anything, right? How are you going to win if you're not even there? You need to be afforded this this opportunity. So yes, will I help? Yes, to the degree of which I don't know. I'll have to see. I'm not a Keynesian economist. I mean, I believe in being pragmatic, and this is what I can afford. So. Yeah, I can't afford a damn thing. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, we're going to be out in Illinois. We're going to come back to New York. We're going to go back to Illinois. I don't have a lot of money in my pocket, but as we just figured out recently, we were able to plow $50,000 in the Libertarian Party of Texas. We were a little grumpy, I'll give you that. We were a little grumpy, but we made it happen, okay? We're gonna be just as grumpy to help New York, and we're gonna be just as grumpy to help Illinois. We're gonna be here, we're gonna be in Buffalo. Are you taking my picture or listening to me? We're gonna be in Buffalo, Wendy, and Katrina, we're gonna be in Dutchess, we're gonna be in Dutchess County raising signatures. We will help get this done, boots on the ground, and by bringing attention to it, we'll plow some money in, even if it doesn't come out of my own empty pocket. Mr. Hornberger, one minute. Yeah. He's coming. He's going that way. He's coming. I'm sorry. Go. Yeah, one minute, Mr. Hornberger. Please go ahead. One of the, the, the big problems here with this is that we're asking signature gatherers to get signatures for a presidential campaign that's going to garner 0 to 1 percent of the vote. I mean, we got 1.1 percent three years ago. The latest presidential poll puts us at 0 percent. And I've been saying that every convention, if you run the same kind of campaign, reform-oriented, immigration reform, social security reform, you're going to get the same result. And that if we want to break out to a higher level, and I believe that's possible, of 10 to 15 percent, you've got to restore the principles of this party and then run a presidential campaign based on those principles. And I contend that can break us out to 10 to 15 percent that goes way beyond the, this ballot access problem. Uh, obviously, it's a protection racket by Democrats and Republicans, but the way you break out is you achieve a great big vote total in that presidential race. That's what I submit is a, is a solution to this. Yeah, I mean, the question of ballot access is really uh, one of a whole kind of set of issues, and all of them can be addressed by focusing on decentralization and getting control of government at the local level with libertarian people. That's how we do this. And so then the ballot access comes through having built proof of concept uh, governance in those communities. Libertarianism spreads from the bottom up, not from the top down. David Nolan, the founder of the Libertarian Party, said that ballot access is just one vehicle. It is not the end. The end is liberty itself. So in the party, I hate to break it to you, the party is merely a means to an end. It is not the end in itself. Thank you.
All right, here's the free plug time. Uh, I want to help all of you guys in New York. I want to see how you guys can help New York as well and with your friends and family. If you go to votechaseoliver.com slash ballot-access, there is a form right now where you can sign up people who want to earn money, $3,000 a month, and get, uh, and get room and board to come up here in New York and get ballot-access in New Jersey. If you know anybody who lives anywhere around this state or anybody who lives in the state who needs a part-time gig, go here, fill out the form, get involved. There's a map right here that tells you all the states we need ballot access. We need volunteers in all these states, not just New York. But I'm going to work to getting 50 state ballot access, and our team is already putting the tools together to help get people connected to the right people, to get in the, on the ground, boots on the ground, and get it done. Excellent. Good. All right. Um, did I get everybody? I think I did, right? Excellent. I got one, one comment about how we could do it. Nice. 45 seconds. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll take it. Please, go. Ahead. I, I think we could do something like an event that Mike's talking about. I was thinking like a bikini uh, candidate party at work debate. So that we, we, that we <laughs> <laughs> the candidates auction off pieces of their clothing one at a time. <laughs> the candidate who, who is most excited to the party will obviously be naked in the end. <laughs> We tried that at a convention before it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, those of us over 60 are opting out. <laughs> so you are the The more money you put in, the more clothes I will keep on. <laughs> There are some things you can't unsee. <laughs> I do want to go to one more New York specific question, but it does actually go across the, uh, the country. This one is, at, by, by the way, volunteer to start? Volunteer to start the question? I started last time. Uh, so. I'll let Blade will start. Let Blade will start with you, and we'll come towards me this time. All right, so the right to repair laws have already been passed in New York, but only for personal electronic devices. How would, so say again? Can you, can you explain these laws? Yep, in one second. I'll, let me, I'll finish up and I'll explain those of you who don't know. Um, how will you as president expand right to repair across the country and across all consumer businesses such as agriculture? It's a very specific question. Those of you who don't know, right to repair laws is basically the idea that if you own something, you buy it, you have the right to repair it. However, in many cases you do not because the company who sold it to you says, the software in it is theirs, or the parts in it is theirs. You may not repair it without them. You must only go to, to their facility only, and if you do it, it's against the law. You're, you're breaking all kind of IP issues. A lot of problems with that have been happening throughout the world, particularly for people who are, as a piece of agriculture, farmers who you now have some type of computer software in your machine, it goes down, the farmer cannot fix it. Because if he fixes it, he's in trouble. Right? That's not device. You can't control on phone. Things like that. That is what this is about. So now you guys are all clear. Is that clear? Yeah, yes. Go ahead, please. You have 60 seconds. Okay. So um, uh, I, I can I can definitely uh, speak with regards to agriculture. That's what uh, one of the things Louisiana does. Um, I think it's wrong, uh, but at the same time, the government should not necessarily be in control. Um, I think that a government needs to look at this and say, listen. Well, actually, let's back. People need to look at this and say, if there's going to be a monopoly on this particular problem, we need to open up these markets. We should stop giving subsidies to major corporations so that they can actually continue this policy where they continually have to sell seeds that can't actually reproduce. Or you end up having to equipment that you cannot repair. The subsidies to large corporations that allow them to actually function in this manner actually need to go away. Make it a free market all over again. And then ultimately the farmers say, you know what, we don't really need this anymore. We're going to go to the next person. But why should they have such a limited choice that they would actually have to use this particular piece of equipment? Thank you. No, we need to keep the government out of it. Look, we all hate the idea that we can't fix our own shit. I get it. I'm as pissed as anybody. But when you have the government come in and say certain contracts aren't allowed, certain relationships aren't allowed, Certain product repair agreements are not allowed. Invariably, trust me on this, I don't see a lot of gray hair in this room. Thank you. 
The government tries this over and over and over again. It is one disaster after another. They try to fix, you know, uh, the social media platforms in 1996 by jumping in and, and fixing liability, and then they try to fix uh, liability with the pharmaceutical companies, and you know they get all involved with making certain contracts illegal. No, this market will progress. We're going through a crappy time right now, but this market will progress. You do want the opportunity to buy equipment virtually for free with service agreements. You do not want that taken away from you. Notwithstanding that we're going through a weird and crummy period, this will get better. Keep the government out of it. Uh, Mr. Harper, you have one minute, same question. Can we repeat it or are you okay? No, okay. Yeah, I think that we use opportunities like this to raise people's vision to what we libertarians really stand for. Uh, and instead of getting mired down on the technicalities, we stand for the separation of economy and the state. That, that, that's the whole idea of free enterprise. Enterprise is free from government interference or control. And that's the case we need to make to our fellow Americans. That people should be free to engage in any economic business enterprise without state permission, without state interference. The What matters in, in the private sector is usually a matter of contract. If somebody sells a product that says you have to use our repair facilities or you have to use our parts, that's a matter of contract. If you don't like it, don't buy it. If you buy it, then you submit to the terms of the contract. So it's, it's really a nice system. You've got a private sector system, and then you make the case for separating the economy and the state at the national level and at the state level. <laughs> You know, I, I don't want to merely get the government out of it. I want to get the government out altogether. Uh, so I would, I, I'm looking at dismantling the state, not seeing the, how it might work better as a benign institution. I don't take it as one. That being said, we're never going to have real competition as long as there's a monopoly in one area. And what is that one area? The state. I mean, come on, that's the real monopoly. So how do we get rid of that? That's the question. So I'm serious here. We need to run on a bullpap platform. We're not going to win if we're like incrementalists that are going, we got to, well, curtail the state here, uh, massage it over there. That's not, this, this is not going to go anywhere. It won't get, it will not spark the imaginations of people. It will not motivate anyone. And it will not do anything to grow the Libertarian Party. So with regards to private repair, I think the first thing we have to do is understand that farmers are frustrated. They feel like they can't just go to the old neighborhood tractor repair shop and get it fixed. Uh, but once we acknowledge their pain and what they're feeling, we also have to explain to them why this system is actually better. Why it's actually better for you to be able to enter into a service agreement that actually does lower the cost of you actually buying the combine or buying the tractor because you're tied to John Deere or another company having to repair it through them. Uh, but I also think this also presents, presents a real opportunity. If you want to be an entrepreneur and to provide farm equipment without any service agreement or anything, you can start your own company and do that. It's just not going to be very profitable. It won't last very long. Uh, and so I would support the free market, the idea that you know a business is going to do what a business is going to do. You have the right as a consumer to, to choose to use this business or not. And ultimately, there is an advantage to the marketplace if somebody wants to enter it to build tractors that don't require you to have to go to the John Deere or required salesperson to do it. But I also think there's increased value in getting certified on these machines. You know, if a repairman says, hey, I'm John Deere certified, I know that when I work on your equipment, it's going to be good. Uh, that provides an additional service that they can pay more money for. And of course, if anybody screws up, you have the right to go to court and, and fight that and, you know, say they, they effed up, they owe you money. But, you know, right to repair, freedom for all people, you got to get a fight with the free market in this situation. Mr. Collins, one minute, same question. I don't think it's going to even take me a minute. I, I just think that um, you sh there should be a right to free enterprise if you enter into certain contracts. I've been in business for a long time, and certain things that I've had to do in broadcasting, you just kind of agree with that company. You know they got to come out to fix it or whatever else the case might be, and then that's it. you got to have free enterprise. And the things that I've been upset about, I, I, I try to build my own, my, my own situations in order to help, help make it. So I am like totally uh, against this particular thing into the extent that it curtails free markets. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, one minute. 
How many people here think that getting more government involvement is going to fix this situation? <laughs> Nobody, right? Nobody. Because government hasn't fixed our education system. Government hasn't fixed our criminal justice system. Government hasn't fixed our economy. Government is horrible at doing everything. Government breeds mediocrity, and the more government we have, the more mediocre we become. Unfortunately, we don't have a free market in America. We have crony capitalism. We have government in bed with the corporations, and they stifle innovation, and they stifle the ability for America to rise up because they are picking winners and losers in the economy. And we have to stop picking winners and losers. We need to have principled Congress people to hold the corporations accountable. It's not the corporations buying off the, the, uh, the Congress. It's that the Congress are unprincipled. And we need to get new people in Congress, and we need to have term limits so these people aren't in there for 40 years being corrupt, so that we can hold people accountable and let the actual free market work. Everybody, to get that, awesome. Thank you guys for those of you who sent those questions. I now want to return back to our TV show, if I could. We are back on TV again, guys. But this time, it is a bit of a more maybe tougher question, perhaps, a more topical, hot topic question. Again, you will choose whether you are on MSNBC or Vox. You can pick whichever one you want. And you will pick one of three topics. Again, you pick the one you want. Women's reproductive rights, January 6th, or climate change. Either of those three. You want to go first, Dr. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me just repeat the question, but I'll have you go first. Remember, MSNBC or Fox, women's reproductive rights, January 6th, or climate change. Either one. And again, I will respond as the host afterwards. Okay. We'll talk for more, and then we'll go down to that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to take on the question. Yeah, let's talk about climate change. And the climate change catastrophes, my mom, MSNBC, oh, MSNBC, oh, MSNBC. MSNBC. Go ahead. Of course. Yes. Um, you want to take, yeah, you want to take it to the, uh, to the ones that are perpetrating this or enabling the state to perpetrate this climate craziness. This, there was recently a guy in California who was arrested for smuggling greenhouse gases from Mexico. And he, he's facing a 30-year prison term. Okay, this is insanity. Uh, now, I won't right here adjudicate the science of climate change, but I can tell you, I'm an historian of science, and it is very flimsy, to say the least. Okay, and so therefore, I would say to them, listen, your climate pretexts are actually pretty, pretty flimsy, and what you want to do in response is so draconian that it could actually cause mass-wide uh, poverty and uh, famine in the, in the developing world. That's a fact. So what they have in mind would be so outrageous, I call it the Great Leap Backward. Uh, out there. Dr. Brookwald, I don't know what you're talking about. You can see the hurricanes, you can see the flooding, you can see what the wars, you can see the refugees, the climate refugees. Why are you so selfish and not wanting to help the poor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I, I gotta say that, uh, you know, you're, you're using, um, your premises are flawed. Uh, there, there is no increase in, uh, in any hurricane, cyclone activity, or in, in terms of any fires, that is all, in the last 46 years, it's actually gone down. Plus, there have been further, many, many less climate deaths in the last 50 years than during the uh, previous year. So, during this so-called climate emergency, we don't, we don't see the emergencies. Thank you. Uh, MSNBC and January 6th. Great. Uh, those of you here at M MSNBC that have been claiming that this is an insurrection, violent takeover of the government, that theory is ludicrous to the extreme. This was a protest. Okay, people get hyped up during a protest and they, they, things get out of control. But everybody knows what an AR-15 is and an AK-47 is. If you want to commit violence, you know you go in there like they did at Columbine and Uvalde and you start shooting it up. Nobody was shooting it up there. They were maybe putting their feet up on the desk. The people that shot, they were shooting up were the Capitol policemen, like the one that shot Ashley Babbitt. He's the guy. He's the guy that 
prosecuted for murder. If I were president, I'd pardon number one, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and Ross Elbert, and second would be the January 6th people. It's an absolute travesty of justice what we've done to these people. Look, what, I, what you're not getting at all is Donald Trump literally put together fake electors. That was all just a ruse so the fake electors could come in and actually change what the American people wanted. If it wasn't for, for Pence, Donald Trump would have actually usurped this country and he would have never left the White House. Why would you accept that as true? Well, I have no doubts that Donald Trump would have used any excuse whatsoever to remain in power. But the fact is that when the Pentagon issued a formal statement, remarkable, the Pentagon had never done this, declaring Joe Biden to be president, Donald Trump knew that it was over for him. But the fact is that these protesters who were supporters of Trump, no question about it, they were over there trying to, to um, get him legally elected president, were simply protesting. They were not trying to take over this government, and they did not deserve to be treated in the way they were treated. They deserve to be released from jail immediately. Mr. Chermont, um, where are you, and which of the three will you pick? Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, January 6th, just for a moment, I really liked what Jacob had to say about it. It was obviously oh, not an insurrection. Uh, he was on MSNBC? Yes. I guess I'm on Fox. Fox Thank you, Laura. It's a great joy to be on the Ingram <laughs> Show today. Uh, look, uh, your, your network has, has correctly identified this as a, uh, as a misappropriated problem. But I think it's important for us all to remember that there was a reason why these people were upset, right? We don't want to be in a situation where we say, oh, gee, you know, you were protesters and you were stupid. And, you know, thanks for playing our game. Uh, we'll get back to you next week. It's not enough just to say it was not an insurrection, in my view. It, we need to go further. And by the way, I think I need to hasten to add, there were individuals there who committed violent acts and sometimes, you know, sometimes individuals need to go to jail. But in the main, that was not the case. We all saw the truth. In the main, that was not the case. What an insurrection looks like is this. This is what an actual insurrection looks like. When you're trying to take over your government and you're trying to change things in profound ways, it doesn't look like a bunch of hooligans who are pissed off. We're pissed off too, and we need to adopt that attitude, but go about it legally. Thanks a lot. that we should be pardoning everybody who's there because they all went there because they believed it was the right thing to do. Donald Trump was obviously innocent. He did not start that. So we do know that Donald Trump is not is innocent and everyone should be pardoned, correct? Uh, everyone who did not commit an act of violence should be pardoned. The idea that the government is, is criminalizing things without violence is absolutely uh, repugnant. And by the way, you, you did say the T word. You brought up the Donald. Uh, I have a, a long history of disliking this guy. Uh, I, you know, I was in New York in the 80s, so I know where by which I speak. Donald Trump is not a conservative. I'm not just saying he's not a libertarian. He's not a conservative. His values do not align with the values of our viewers, Laura. And so it's important to remember, if you join the Republican Party out of some sense of a certain set of values, you better align with us in the Libertarian Party. Dr. Clay, where are you and what topic will you choose? Okay, so I'd like to go on Fox um, because I think this would be a bit controversial and I'd like to talk about women's uh, rights. So, <clears throat> I'll be frank, I do not necessarily believe in abortion. If uh, abortion were something my parents had chosen, uh, I wouldn't be here and they were high school sweethearts. Um, and so, um, uh, and that's where I stand personally. At the same time, as a physician, I see people come in the clinic on a daily basis um, that have their children with mental retardation, cerebral palsy, and it tears these families apart. Um, I believe a woman should be able to choose what she wants to do with her body. And that is just flat out, I think, the right thing to do up to a point until you have a viable child uh, that has a nervous system, um, cardiovascular system, and that child, would, if born, would actually be human. 
Um, too often the state takes these children and doesn't afford the family or does not afford um, the child the care that he or she needs. On any given day, a child will come into clinic, and at 18, they can go to the children's hospital. But when they get to 18 days, or excuse me, 19 days, or 19 years, the children's hospital will dump them under Medicaid. Um, they have no cardiologists, they have no ENT, they have no orthopedics, they have no, they go on. I mean, just the, the and so this family's now stuck. They have a child that they can't, can't take care of, while at the same time, the state's going to say, you have to have that child. Is it is illegal for you to actually have an abortion if that mother knows that that child is going to have some catastrophic genetic abnormality. And I think it's just flat out wrong for the state to be telling people this. But the state absolutely will protect children if a parent is trying to harm that child. The state may arrest the parent if the parent's trying to harm the child. The state may remove the child from the family if they find that the mother or father should physically harm that child. Abortion is physically harming the child. How can you say such a thing? How can you say that you believe abortion is bad? That is an absolute lie. That? And if for the persons that want to come out and say that he or she supports, you know, everyone should be born. Um, we used to take care of, of children that were in, uh, that are, they're in homes down in uh, Medina, Texas, right? That's what we, everybody would get together and buy Christmas presents, etc. There are kids that are living in, 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 in foster families, they're living in, in orphans, orphanages that basically um, uh, don't have anyone. They don't have much of anything. Um, and so to think that the state somehow actually takes care of these uh, children is a lie. I'll do uh, January 6th, and uh, I'll guess I'll be on Fox. Okay. Our election systems are rigged, but not for the reason that most people think. Our election systems are rigged because of gerrymandering, because of winner-take-all laws, because of back ballot access laws. Our election systems are rigged because we do not have the ability to audit our elections. Every citizen should be able to audit our elections. Every citizen should be able to look at the machine code and know its source. Every citizen should have the right to be, uh, if they are a criminal, they should have the right to vote restored after they have served their time. These are all pieces of my voters' bill of rights to restore the integrity of our voting system in America. Because if we do not have free and fair elections in America, our republic is crap. Our republic is failing. People get disenfranchised. They stop voting. And when they stop voting and they don't feel like they have a voice, they riot. And we saw this not only in January 6th, but we saw it in Black Lives Matter. People are pissed off whether they're left or right because they do not feel like the system represents them. I have been voting my entire life. I have never elected a congressperson that I have voted for. I do not feel represented in America, and this is something that we have to change. This, thank you. This Voter's Bill of Rights is the fix to this thing. It is nonpartisan. We're pushing it out to Congress people and legislatures all over the country. I urge you to go to Lars24.com. If you take nothing else away from this today, go to Lars24.com, download the Voter's Bill of Rights, get it to your Congress people, and let's start changing our election systems so that we can have faith and integrity in our election systems again. Thank you. So what you're saying then is that January 6ers were correct in what they did. Mail-in, mail-in voting is a terrible idea. Ballot hoppers things should be illegal, and we should stop all those things that we can stop the mules that are clearly stealing the lot in the election, correct? Uh, no, not correct. I think that we all agree that we could have better elections, that our elections are not run fairly and with integrity. And there's a lot of solutions out there, but it doesn't seem like either the Republicans or the Democrats want to embrace any of these actual solutions because they like the system the way that it is. It's rigged to work for them. It's rigged to keep them in office. That's why we have 90% re-election rate with a 20% approval rate. We have to get term limits and get these people out of there so that we can have a functioning republic again and not crony capitalism and not the rich and the elite telling us all how to live our lives. Mr. Collins, where are you and which of the three topics will you be speaking on? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Sorry, please, you, are, you. You, have, you have won, you have won the nomination, and now you're able to go onto TV, mainstream TV, the legacy media, and have a conversation. You can go on either MSNBC or Fox, you pick, 
but you must speak on one of three topics, either women's reproductive rights, January 6th, or climate change. You have 90 seconds, and then I will respond and push back for a bit. You have 30 seconds to push back from my pushback. Sure. Okay. I would, uh, MSNBC. MSNBC. And, and certainly it would be climate change. Climate change. Got it. I, I think the human impact uh, on our environment as it's, it, it is e eroding um, ourselves. I think with one of the things that I'm very passionate about, and I know this is not uh, popular with a lot of people, but we have tons of plastics in our oceans and tons of things like that. Those things are like, we've got to get, and it's affecting our food chain. And our environmental impact and our environmental footprint in, in, uh, of humans, it, it's something that we have to really begin to take a hard look at. We have to, we have, to have um, uh, marketing and media to tell people, hey, don't drop plastics. You know, don't let the plastics go in the storm drains. So let's, let's, let's do this whole out of call to try to keep our water systems fresh because one of the greatest things that we're facing um, in our country is water. Uh, water is like a rare commodity, and you, you know, a lot of the, uh, even though there's lots of beautiful water right here, but I can imagine a, a big company would want to go drain all the water out of that bay and sell it to you in a bottle. You know, so these are things that, to me, we just have to take a look at and that are important. Excellent. I'm so happy that you agree. So obviously, we want to either ban more plastics. Or well, perhaps we want to uh, tax the corporations and force them to clean up the plastics. Which one is a better option? We, um, as the American people, are going to use plastics, um, but we're going to we're going to do that. I don't think it's necessarily a plastic ban. I just think that it's a, it's, it's how we use plastics in our environment and how we use plastics in our in our homes and how we recycle plastics to make it better. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Oliver. Mr. Oliver, where are you and what topic? I'm going to talk to MSNBC about climate change. Now, I'm assuming I'm going to Joy Reid. So, Joy, I, whether you agree or disagree with the science of climate change, there is one thing that we can all say that we want. We have cleaner air, cleaner water, and we want government to stop picking the winners and losers of things. So for that, we want to remove all energy subsidies because carbon is the thing they most subsidize and get government's boot off the neck of nuclear power so it can come online faster. Secondly, if you want to reduce the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere, we need to talk about who the biggest polluter in the United States is, and that's the United States military. So when we end the warfare state and bring the troops home, we'll stop the polluting there. And lastly, we're going to talk about what's going to fix the problems that we have, like the plastics in our waters and the other environmental concerns. It's not going to be government picking winners and losers through the acts of subsidies and deciding whose technology is going to be best. It's going to be unleashing the power of the free market for innovators to clean up because we have a vested concern in having clean air and clean water, and we need to get government out of the way of those innovators who can come in the marketplace and find ways to clean our air and clean our water and not have them tax us to pick their winners and losers like they did with Solyndra, where they spent billions of dollars for a solar company that went right under. Lastly, I would say this to you, MSNBC folks. If you think solar power or wind power is going to fix it without nuclear power, you are crazy. The footprint of a nuclear power plant is infinitesimally smaller than the acres and acres and acres and acres and acres and acres and acres you would need of solar panels to create the same amount of power and you don't have the battery storage capability to do it. So the only way, if you want to have a renewable future, is to embrace the best power system, the nuclear power system, and quit being fear mongers about 50 year old technology that doesn't really exist anymore. is the reason for all of these problems. The free market is what is created. The free market creates greedy people who take all the resources, who exploit the poor. I can't believe that. This is nothing but more exploitation. You are a shill for the big corporation. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great bit of propaganda you threw at me, but the truth is, is that the free market is what allows us to free ourselves and get ourselves out of the problems we have. The free market unleashes the ability for us to create new technologies, unleashes the ability for us to increase our standard of living through innovation, through market technology. They actually bring people out of being uh, crushed under the jurisdiction of the state. If you look at socialist economies, look at our Western European neighbors, those with the most social economies have the least economic mobility. If you're born poor, you're going to die poor. But if you live in the United States and you work hard and we have a truly free market without the government picking the winners and losers, you can work hard, climb up the ladder, and achieve something better for your future. All right, everybody, I think I did, right? Excellent. So now I'd like, if I could, and I'll ask for a volunteer, the volunteer, if I could have one. Volunteer to go first this time? For uh, touch through or what? Yep. 
volunteer? I will take you. Mr. Massey, look at me. I'll take you. You'll volunteer. We're going to go this way. For I'll what have we volunteered? Um, I'd like you to think about the answers you just heard. All the answers you just heard, mm -hmm. all the responses you just heard. Mm -hmm. Think of one of them that you think could have been better mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> take the person, announce what could have been better. That person will have 30 seconds to respond to that. You have one minute to sure. make it happen. I appreciate that. We're going without microphone, or do I see the podium today? <coughs> <coughs> blah, 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 blah. I think, uh, 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 Mr. Collins, uh, you were talking about MSNBC and about uh, climate change. I think it's important for us to recognize that we need a complete separation in this country of the government from the business of science. This is where we went, this is where we went wrong with vaccines, it's where we've gone wrong in pharmaceuticals in general, it's where we've gone wrong in medical uh, procedures. And, uh, and substances in, in even more general terms. It's where the war on drugs went wrong, way back when. We need a complete separation. It may well be that we are facing important climate challenges in the future. It may well be. This is a public policy forum. We should not be discussing that science. If it comes to pass, and it may well, who is it that you want deploying resources in order to take care of that problem? You want the federal government to take care of it? You want the state government to take care of it? You want the local government to take care of it? The answer is the same, no. You want the private sector to lead the charge toward dealing with that problem. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, listen, the truth of the matter is, there are some things the government is good for. I mean, we can bang the government and, 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 and certainly I'm for smaller government and I don't like government intervention. I don't like the rules or regulations. I've spent, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars battling the government on different issues for my own business. And, and there's some things that I just hate the government for. But some things the government does do well and sometimes you gotta just take the lead. And then this is one of those things where you have to be, take the leadership around the world because you have other countries that are poisoning our environment just as much as our own government um, as well. 45 seconds, are you good? Okay, go ahead. Mr. Chamath, go ahead. No, this is absolutely untrue. It is not true that the government is good at some things, either by the standards of other governments or the standard of local government or the standard of business. That is an absolute lie. If anyone in here believes this, we need to talk on the phone. My phone number is in the brochure. Everyone got a brochure, by the way? Everyone got a brochure? You need to call me. That is simply untrue. Where are the most polluted places in the world? The most dominated by government. This is the truth. The reason, the reason that the science was so messed up in vaccines was because of government intervention. The reason that you... The reason that you cannot believe the science on climate change is because of government intervention. The reason pharmaceuticals are developed in a way that is inefficient and ineffective is because of liability protection because of government intervention. Thanks. I threw mine. Oh, please, wait, wait a second, go. You know, I, I love the theatrics, right? And certainly that is the theatrics of someone who's not prepared to win the presidency. Because to say that the government is not going to do some things better, why are we up here running for president? We're because running the for government president. doesn't do I, This is my time. You've had your time. You've had your time. This is my time now. Go ahead. I'll give you five more seconds. Go ahead. Some things, that's why we're here. We have to take a winner's attitude to what we're actually going to do when we get in the White House. Otherwise, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here trying to make America better. We shouldn't be here trying to make it greater. We shouldn't be here trying to reduce our government and make our policy stronger to help everybody in America. And to me, what you just said, when you said the government doesn't do everything right, there is one thing it might do right, Maybe if it elects me as the President of the United States, we're going to do things right.
Now, I'm a minarchist, so I believe the government should fit in the palm of your hand. And even the things that we say the government should do, they don't do very well. Uh, and, and the initiation of force is what we oppose here in this. And anything that we're talking about with regards to climate change, forcing people to buy certain products, change the way they do business, change the way they live their lives, change the way they get power, change the way they live in their homes, all of that is incumbent upon the initiation of force. And so I seek to reduce the amount of force in our lives. The reason why we are running for president is because we are unlike every other party that insists on using force to push their values on other people. That's why we're running as libertarians. That's why we are libertarians, because we believe that good ideas don't require force. I guess I'm going to have to jump in here because, you know, uh, we say that, you know, we, we, we can't initiate force, but yet we give to the government that right, that the right to initiate force, and to initiate violence, retaliatory uh, action, or, or uh, initiatory force. So, you know, this, this isn't going away. I, I think that minarchy lies on the path to where we need to go, and I don't think that it's more than a way station. But, you know, I think that you can't, you've got to be clear here when we're messaging. Yes, the government does nothing right, including uh, protect our rights. In fact, it's the greatest infringer of rights that exists. <laughs> How can we not see that? All righty. Okay, good. Dr. Belay, please, one person and uh, 60 seconds. So I'm not picking on anyone, but I'll, uh, Chase, I just want to echo what he said. I think he was correct in what he told you. Uh, a minute ago, and I'll speak to medicine in particularly. Um, the reason why medicine costs you so much right now is because the government's involved. Uh, there's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, if you come into the clinic, we have to use separate items for every individual. Uh, most of these are now throwaway disposables. Uh, you're not using German instruments, you're using Chinese instruments. We'll never go to war with China. We can't afford to. Everything's made in China these days. Go into a surgical suite, figure out if you're going to use a product without it coming from another country. Good luck, right? It wouldn't last two weeks, right? We had to wait in COVID for all the N95 masks coming from another country. It's pathetic. Nothing's made here in the United States anymore. So to echo what he said, uh, government is breeds mediocrity. It's 100% true. Um, um, outside of uh, there needs to be some guardrails or some guardrails so that uh, companies don't go off the rails and uh, abuse persons. But the reason why it costs so much when any of you guys come to my clinic is simply because the government made it this way. Yeah, I can't wait to hopefully get on the debate stage with Joe Biden and talk about the biggest lie about the cost of medicine. That is that he said, I made insulin $35 for everybody. He didn't actually do that. What he did is he made insulin $35 for the end user. He spread that cost across Medicare payments and across your insurance premiums, making them higher. There are ways to reduce the cost of insulin. You allow people to buy across borders. You end the patent ever greeting system that allows a few uh, select people to have the, uh, the sole power to create insulin without generics. And then you, uh, and these free market principles are things that could actually reduce the cost of insulin for people who are suffering from diabetes. But because of the failure of government, all you hear is about the status solution and not the free market one. I'll go with uh, Joseph also on uh, climate change. I have a piece of policy, and the policy is that we're going to be shutting down all of our bases around the world. And when we shut down all of our military bases around the world and start bringing those troops home, we're going to have a dividend, so to speak. And I want to take that dividend one time, and I want to create an energy race. And this is actually part of my uh, economic policy, but also of my national security policy. Because when we start an energy race, similar to the space race, we can embrace nuclear power, we can embrace new technologies, we can let free market environmentalism go to work, and we can find the solutions allowing the free market to do so. I want to use the energy race to vastly reduce the cost of energy, which will vastly reduce the inflation that we're seeing today. It will raise the standard of living across the board. And more importantly, it will raise our GDP. And by raising our GDP, we can start getting down and whittling down our national debt because we're going to have a lot more money. And then we can start reducing and eliminating the taxes that we want to do. All of there's a lot of North Star in the Libertarian Party, but we need a plan to actually get there. I have a plan. Lars24.com. Check it out. I think we have to take energy very seriously in our country. 
I think we have to look at energy from every perspective, whether it's nuclear energy, hydroelectric, central, uh, central, centrifugal energy, or even solar energy. We've got to, most, a lot of our wars have been because of energy. And we've got to become energy efficient and, de and self dependent here in America. Sure, I would argue uh, it's both. Both of you guys, um, both are correct in some way, shape, or form. How many people in, in this room have multiple energy companies from which he or she can choose? I mean, why is it so regulated, right? The government says in New Orleans we have to use energy. Um, yet, if I have a large solar farm myself, I can't pump it back into the grid. You can't buy it from me directly. Um, why, why are alternative energy sources actually promoted? But at the same time, we're actually not putting our money where, my mouth, where our mouth is. There are too many regulations uh, that are simply controlled by government. Uh, there's a monopoly on this. We've already confirmed that no one in this room believes in monopolies, particularly when it's, uh, when it's intrusive as per government mandate. Thank you. Awesome. Down to uh, you, uh, Mr. Oliver. It's your turn. Is that right? No, no, you just went. Mr. Collins. Hold on. No, no, I'm sorry. No, Mr. Collins just went. I'm sorry. Now it's Mr. Collins. Thank you very much. Mr. Collins, please. You, you have, have to pick somebody. You, you okay. have one minute, one person who you thought could have done better at their answer to the question on MSNBC or Fox. Sure. So the person that I would choose is Chase. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with with different looks at energy policies, and I don't just I think that he could not stress it enough. I think we have to become ener energy independent around the world. We should not be dependent on these foreign countries for our resources for America. If we're going to be uh, independent and self-reliant uh, libertarians, it starts from us cutting out our dependency on foreign energy. And I, I agree with him wholeheartedly, and he just couldn't stress it enough. So I actually worked in shipping, and I'll tell you one thing that could help domestic energy producers is we got rid of the Jones Act so we could actually move natural gas from domestic port to domestic port. Right now we have the North East and the power of natural gas because we're outside of this country, but we have the most natural gas in the world. And this is done for the very reason that government has mandated that if you move something from U.S. port to U.S. port, it has to be on a U.S. flag, U.S. built, U.S. cruise ship. We don't have enough of it. We don't have one liquid natural gas ship that can do that. And so this is why you're paying more for energy here in the Northeast, because you're importing natural gas when you could be getting good old-fashioned American natural gas if government would get out of the way. So we've had uh, climate change, we've had uh, women's reproductive health. I do want to talk about women's reproductive health. I'm not afraid to say that I'm a pro-choice American. Now, I want to speak to why I think that that is okay if you're pro-life. Because I do believe there are things we can work on together that decrease the ability or the availability or the, the need for an abortion in this country. We can make birth control over the counter so people have easier access to contraception so there's no pregnancy to abort in the first place. We can increase the idea of education around contra uh, comprehensive sex education that is not just absence, only that does teach your kids, uh, hey, if you're going to do something, you better do it safe so you don't get pregnant. I don't think it should be required, but I think we need to be thinking about that more as parents. And then lastly, this is a Bali autonomy issue. I recognize this is a very personal issue to people, but when I talk to voters across the country, and many of them are Republicans, Democrats, they're not all libertarians, I'll tell you that for sure, that one of the first questions I get asked by women is, are you going to regulate my body using the force of government? And I say no. Uh, I agree with Chase. Um, I think that's a, a, a strong position. Um, I will reiterate um, my experiences are what drove me to this decision and seeing what the government uh, does and does not do. Um, I firmly believe um, that uh, life is precious. Don't, please do not, uh, do not get me wrong in that regard. Um, I've spent my entire life, or adult life, taking care of people and I'm going to continue to do so when I go home on Monday. Um, so I think you're correct. Who could have been 
better or different? Well, yeah, I'd like to address what Lars said just a moments ago about cr creating uh, an energy race. Who is this we that is going to create this energy race? It must be the state because otherwise it's left to the market and market uh, market players to determine what the speed of uh, of the energy race is. It would depend on entrepreneurs of deciding what is the uh, proper place for energy uh, allocation and resource allocation. So it isn't, uh, there's no we that should be undertaking this at all. And this brings me to a more fundamental point, which is that we shouldn't be looking for the state to take over certain good functions and, and say, well, that's a good function for the state. No, that's a bad function for the state. No, we should be trying to diminish and dismantle it entirely. This is not enough to talk about different reforms. That acts as if the state is a good vehicle or something. Here we go. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, no, I'm not in advocating for the state to do anything. In fact, I'm advocating for abolishing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'm actually, a, um, want the free market to embrace this, but we have to get the state out of the way in order for the free market to embrace it because the free market is stifled by regulation from our government. The free market would be embracing nuclear technology if we didn't have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission stifling it and not allowing any plants to be built for over 40 years. So I'm not, in, I'm not advocating for state involvement. All right, um, now, uh, yes, last, uh, last but not least, Mr. Hornberger, one minute and one person. Um, it's on the climate change issue, and I, I guess I'll just mention Joe Collins. Okay. You know, we have to challenge this premise that government's concerned about the environment. I mean, it's an absolutely false premise. They are interested in power, and that's all it is. And you can see that this government, look at their nuclear testing. Look what they did with nuclear testing above ground and below ground. There's people in the Pacific that still can't even return to their islands because of what they've done. You can see people with foreign military bases that uh, they polluted their, their whole area with bombing raids. Look what they did to Iraq and Afghanistan with their uranium bombs and so forth. The best protector of the environment is the private sector. You know, I, I come from South Texas. I grew up there. Every South Texas rancher protects his ranch like you wouldn't believe. Protects his livestock, protects his deer. Uh, he, you can count on private owners to protect their own property. And that's the, that's the idea that we need to restore here in America. Get government out of the environment and leave it to the private sector to resolve these problems. Energy is our biggest problem in our country. We have to take energy very seriously, and we have to take the lead on energy in the world. And right now, we are not. We are depending on foreign countries to provide energy for our nation. And to me, there's, there's, that's just like a travesty of, uh, that's a travesty of, uh, 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 I don't even know what the word is, it's just a travesty. Thank you. Larry, I'll go ahead. I'll go too. So I, I, I want to say the reason why I'm, I'm so passionate about, about energy is, is because what we're talking about is turning a generator. We're talking about whether you're using hydro or hydroelectric, or whether you're using nuclear power, we're talking about turning a generator. And we've got to take a look at how can we best turn the generator to generate energy to stop us from depending on foreign countries. Mr. Yeah, 45 seconds, please. Yeah, I want to weigh in on this minarchy versus anarchy situation. I've been in this movement a long time. And I can tell you that there's two definitions of minarchy in, in this party and in this movement. There's one minarchy movement, uh, aspect of the movement that says they favor immigration reform, social security reform, five-year plans to continue social security, they want to keep Medicare and Medicaid, they want to use health savings accounts, they use school vouchers, they believe in public schooling, reform, reform, reform of the serfdom society in which we live, and they call that minarchy. My concept of minarchy is the dismantling of every single infringement on freedom. If you leave, 
infringements on freedom intact, including school vouchers and public schooling, you are not achieving a free society. And that's why I'm a minarchist in the tradition of the founding principles of this party and of this movement. Mics, please. Either one of those mics, one of them. Excellent. I require a volunteer from the audience, someone who will walk around. I require one volunteer from the audience, somebody who will walk around. Please. Thank you. I am now going to ask if anyone has a specific question. You may ask any question you like, one question to only one of them. And only one of them will answer. If anybody wants to use their uh, their chits to answer, they may. If they're not, they're not ask. You may not ask a question to the same person twice. That's the only rule. You may not ask for a question. Do you have a question? No, this is twice in a row. Twice in a row. Sorry. Yes, twice in a row. You may not ask. Thank you for that clarification. You may not answer. They will have one minute to answer your question. I have two rules for the question. Number one, please form it in the shape of a question. <laughs> Number one, and then a please, not the same person twice in a row. Go ahead. Thank you. My question is for Mr. Hormer um, uh, regarding the Social Security situation. Um, I know you've I've been to many debates where you disparage like the off-ramp idea, but if you're a libertarian, would you not believe that the state once, if you have your view on Social Security, robbed you once to collect all this money? Would they not be robbing you a second time if there's no offering? For example, if you contributed many years to Social Security, um, including giving the most, and then suddenly you're approaching that age and you're not allowed to get it. What is your solution to those people who've given all this money all these years? Thank you so much. Uh, Doug, before you go, uh, Mr. Rumpel, I'm going to give you 90 seconds. That's a long one. Give me 90 seconds to respond to that. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, one, one second. Don't start the time yet. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> Show this time. Uh, first of all, it's important to recognize that this is a socialist program. It was imported from, from Germany among German socialists. They don't call it Social Security for nothing. Nobody puts in anything. Okay, You pay taxes. We've all paid taxes all of our lives. Where does this money come from? It comes from the young and the productive. It's a straight coercive transfer program. It takes money from one group of people and gives it to another group of people. That's morally wrong. That's the initiation of force. There is no care or compassion in a, in a system that is based on the initiation of force through the coercive apparatus of the government. It is not a retirement fund. Nobody has put money into anything. Most important, it's the mindset of dependency that is inculcated in the American people, including people right here in this party, that there would be people dying in the streets if we were to repeal this program immediately. It's, which is what we should do with Medicare and every other socialist program. We've got to lead this country in the restoration of faith in freedom, voluntary charity, and free markets. The churches of America are filled with people, faith-filled people. They would undoubtedly help those in need. Children and grandchildren who are no longer paying income taxes, FICA taxes, come forward and help out grandparents and parents on a voluntary basis. That's what genuine charity is all about, and that's where we need to lead the way, out of the socialist morass. You haven't given into anything. You've paid taxes. And when you say, I'm going to get a refund of my taxes, you're talking about using the IRS to steal money from this group of people in order to get your refund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next one. Go ahead. Next question, please. Hi, this is for Mr. Hornberger. It may not be to Mr. Hornberger, you just got the last question. Yeah, it's going to be somebody else. Somebody, uh, yeah. Oh. You can oh. go next after next. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can wait and have someone else ask questions. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. This question is for Mr. Collins. Welcome to my home. I live here. And I get to be in this room. And we talk about the drug problem in urban areas. I find there might be a little bit of misunderstanding. Um, my son, who's 19, has had three friends in the past six months overdose and die. He was at a funeral yesterday with his, for his 19-year-old best friend. All of those families could be sitting in this room. All of those families raised those kids to go to college, to get into the trades, all of that. 
What is your solution for neighborhoods like mine to help address the drug problem that you spoke about, you know, in general? Because, you know, middle America, we have a real problem too. There you go. That's good. Someone getting a mic, please? Is that the mic, Dan? Oh, we, we gave away the other mic. No, he's not ready to come in. We have one. Good. Yeah. We good? Yeah. Go ahead, it's Colin's answer, please. So, first I want to say I'm, I'm really sorry for your loss, the loss of your family. Those things are very, very difficult and very, very hard. And I, and I believe, and just let me weigh in on this, I think it might be fentanyl. It was it a fentanyl overdose well, fentanyl. purchase at fentanyl? This is like the new um, drug that's like killing our youth from all over. And, and I, what I want to do is, is put together a real group of people like the doctor here and other people like that to really figure out how do we stop access to these types of to these types of substances that are causing drug abuse. I mean right now the good thing and, and although it's a terrible thing but the good thing is when the crack ep epidemic took place back in the 80s the addicts themselves were treated as criminals but now at least they're saying that this is a medical issue and we can treat them as a medical problem and get help. And so I want to make sure that we provide adequate help and more help for, for people that maybe not the criminalization of people who are dealing with these types of issues. Thank you. Please, go ahead, Mr. Oliver. First off, I want to echo, sorry for your loss and, and what you're going through. But I want to talk about why we need to decriminalize drugs, why we need to end the war on drugs. Now, in Portugal, if you have a drug that you want to know whether there's fentanyl in it, you can go to a pharmacy and pay a small fee and they'll tell you whether that drug has been spiked with fentanyl, which is what's happening all over this country. <laughs> Kids are thinking they're taking a Xanax pill that's been pressed to look like it, but it's actually fentanyl and it kills them. So in a decriminalization uh, environment, we can actually address these issues head on by using the ability to test our drugs, but also it's through direct and mutual aid that we can save people all over the country. I always, anytime we talk about the drug where I shot this guy, Drew Cook, he's the head of the LP Sober Caucus. Right now he runs a group called Shred the Stigma Oklahoma. They issue free Narcan, fentanyl testing, and why do they do this? It's not because they don't want people to use drugs, but they want people that they're gonna use to use safely and be able to save themselves. There's 1,600 people who are alive today because he passed out Narcan in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So there are things we can do as individuals through mutual and direct aid to address this crisis head on while stopping to treat people like criminals and actually address addiction as a medical crisis and get people to therapy, rehab beds, not prison beds. Okay. This is for Mr. Hornberger. Um, you can either agree or disagree with the following statement that I'm about to make, and I want to know why. There has been an ongoing policy to ignore construction of law. For example, with the Second Amendment, I have noticed that they have added two extra commas, thus ter making it grammatically inoperable because you have a dependent clause and an independent clause, and they've done things like take well regulated and make that an actionable an actional uh, verb and ignore things like operative effects of modal auxiliary verbs on action verbs and that this policy which we know to be misconstruction of law evidenced by the intent of law reflected in the preamble to the amendments not a bill of law not a bill of rights okay uh, the prohibitory language has been twisted in order to make government the grantor of rights oh perfect thank you good uh, Mr. Walker, go ahead, please. 90 seconds. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, my, my position on gun rights really is not rooted in the Second Amendment. The, the, the Second Amendment does not give us gun rights any more than it gives us any other rights. We have a right to own whatever we want. That's what private property is all about, including guns. <laughs> guns Gun rights are the, not just for self-defense, which they are, not just for shooting deer. Gun rights are the right to resist tyranny. And the, and the disarmed society becomes the obedient society. And so that's, that's the whole idea behind the Second Amendment. Now, could they have worded it better? I think so. But the fact is that independent of the Second Amendment, even if there had been no Bill of Rights enacted, we still have the right to own guns. I mean, that, that's a fundamental, God-given, natural right. The Second Amendment simply reflected the Founders' 
uh, and our ancestors' philosophy that, hey, we have to retain the right to resist tyranny. They understood that the greatest threat to their freedom and well-being is our own government. And that's exactly the same case today. That is our greatest threat to our freedom. Not Iran, Russia, China, communists, Muslims. It's the government. And it's gun rights to protect that freedom. Excellent. Any other questions from the audience? As long as the question is not this time to over there. As long as it's not uh, directed to Mr. Hornberger. Okay. Uh, my question is for Michael Rechterwald, and uh, right now you would probably be my second choice of the people on the stage, and there's one thing that's holding me back, and it's we've seen a lot of people come in and out of the party throughout the years, and you haven't been a libertarian that long, and I'm not convinced if you don't get the nomination you won't be a libertarian in a year or two. Can you speak to that? Sir, thank you for the question. Uh, I've addressed this question many times. I've been a lowercase libertarian for eight years. Uh, I've written five books from a libertarian perspective. I've been writing for the Mises Institute for six years. I've spoken at dozens of their conferences around the country. I have been uh, tirelessly promoting liberty. Uh, the reason I kept sitting when I was doing these media questions is because I've been on those shows. I've been on the, uh, Laura Ingram, and I've been delivering the, the liberty message in the context of whatever the topic is. Uh, so I know that they say they stay sitting. Nobody stands up unless you're going to rush the uh, the stage with the, uh, with, the uh, with the host. So the point being is that look, I had a conversion from statism to a liberty philosophy. There's no going back when you take that. There's absolutely no return from liberty. It is the most liberating experience of my life. And I certainly have no intention of reverting to something statist after all this. Uh, they put me through hell, and thank you for that. I thank them, these statists, these authoritarians, for attacking me, because it allowed me to find freedom in myself. Thank you. Audience, one right there. Oh, one. Go ahead, please. As long as this question is not to Dr. Wall, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I was going to ask Dr. Wall, but being this is a question that maybe basically could be asked to anyone, uh, Chase, Mr. Oliver. Um, in the long shot chance that New York State here actually achieves ballot access, and you were to be chosen as a national pick, would you be able to help LPNY maybe? use government force, uh, per se, if a chosen placeholder decides not to relinquish that ballot spot. I mean, you wouldn't be on a ballot here in New York if that individual chose uh, uh, thought that maybe you were milk toast like Joe Jorgensen. Yeah, so uh, first off, I hope I don't have to have that fear. But if, uh, if that were to occur, I don't think I could you know, physically punch the Secretary of State into putting me on the ballot. If I could, I would, I suppose, if I had to, because uh, they're, you know, they're preventing us from having our choice. Uh, but what I'll say is, is I look forward to coming to New York as our candidate. I look forward to earning the spot on the ballot, and I look forward to helping you earn the 2% you need to get the major party set so you retain ballot access. Because we shouldn't have to have these fights every two or four years. It's a status tactic to prevent us from rising up. And so I look forward to doing everything I can. Once we get those signatures on the ballot, once the volunteers get on the ground and I'm knocking the doors to help them do it, I absolutely will do everything I can to secure ballot access here in the Empire State so the Empire can't keep you down anymore. <laughs> I won't initiate force against anybody. Uh, if Larry refuses to give it up, I'll give him a good thrashing outside and we'll see if he gives it up then. <laughs> it might be consensual, it's all good. I'm not going to get up here now. It's all good, yes. Um, sorry, yes. The question back there, yes, please, not to Mr. Oliver. As County Director, Ron, what are your views on the Great Reset and people like Klaus Schwab and the rest of their ilk? Oh, okay, well this is public record. I've, I've written a book on the, the Great Reset. It's called The Great Reset and the Struggle for Liberty. And so it is written from a distinctly libertarian point of view. And the Great Reset is real. Um, it is a, a global regime, it's a global movement 
to drive into local governments and state governments and national governments various prerogatives of this global elite. They want to starve us of capital in terms of investment in various types of products. They want to divert all investments to the kinds of uh, sustainable uh, companies that they deem to be acceptable. It is a coercion scheme initiated really by NGOs and corporations, oddly, but it gets driven into law. Uh, uh, that's how it's followed up. It's, it's driven into legislation, or in the case of Biden, I think over 12 uh, executive orders. So what they're doing is attempting to reset the economic uh, uh, prospects of everybody in the world. They want to reduce our standard of living. This is no, there's no question about it. And they want to do this across the board. And they want sustainability and equity. These two terms are complete mis misnomers. Uh, sustainability means zero economic growth. And equity means uh, tr wealth transfers from the develop developed world to the developing world to keep them from developing. That's what it's about. Uh, you already asked the question. There's other people who want. Let me get them first before I get to you. Other people who want to ask? Please, this one is not to Dr. Reckonball. Uh, this question is for Mike. Um, what did you learn from the Gary Johnson and Joe Jorgensen campaigns? And uh, what would you do differently? Let's get to Mike quickly, please. Sure, I appreciate that. Uh, it is the reason I'm in the campaign, to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, I hope nobody takes this personally. We all have friends who uh, work on those campaigns. I would uh, include Gary and Joe as friends of ours uh, to this moment, right? But we need to learn that we uh, have to do two very fundamental things very differently than, than the way those campaigns went. Number one, we have to run an extremely principles-forward platform. We need to completely differentiate from Republicans and from Democrats. And the reason you need to do that is in order for libertarians to find us, right? Most Americans have a libertarian streak. But most libertarians have learned, one way or another, standing out in Walmart parking lots, right? The value of the Libertarian Party brand is approximately zero. The other thing that we need to do very, very differently is to run a very professional and a very credible campaign. As you all know, I am not the charming, good looks candidate in this race, as though that needed to be said, right? We spend a lot of energy protecting our credibility. We provide, thank you. Uh, we pro <laughs> Anybody want to argue with me about that? We spend a lot of time preserving our credibility and we lean very hard into my background in public service and public policy. As you know, I was an economist for 25 years. I worked for the White House. I've taught economics at three different universities. I've had my own business. I've been a professional advocate for free markets in Washington for a decade. I didn't become a cop until it was a second career. This does not carry a lot of water inside the Libertarian Party. I recognize that. Frankly, it doesn't carry a lot of water with me. But outside, it matters. Thanks a lot. Anybody have 45 seconds on that? Excellent. We'll go one more question before we go to uh, 60 second closing statements. One more question, please. And it may not be to Mr. Tremont. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try something non controversial. Um, I guess I'll pitch it to Mr. Hornberger. If you were president, how would you resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict? Does Palestine have the right to exist as a sovereign entity? And is Zionism compatible with libertarianism? Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one more question out of that one. It was in the room. Okay. Hello. Yes. Easy question. Oh, I mean, true. Yes. Simple question for you, Mr. Hartwick. Go ahead. I really think the, the job of a Libertarian Party presidential candidate is to focus on primarily on how to achieve freedom in our land so that we can lead the world to freedom rather than trying to figure out solutions to all the bad things that happen around the world, including wars between people. Um, that means that's what leadership is all about, and that entails necessarily a non-interventionist foreign policy. No foreign aid to anyone, including the Israeli government or to the people of Gaza. 
Just like Social Security, there is no care and compassion that goes into foreign aid. It's government money that has been stolen from the American taxpayers. If people want to help Israel or help the people of Israel, send your money there. Send it to Gaza. Now, having said that, uh, I, it, we all have to feel sympathy for what everybody over there, the people in Gaza, people in Israel with the Hamas attacks, how can you not feel sympathy? I think Israel has clearly followed the lead of the U.S. after the 9-11 attacks when we just went right into Afghanistan and Iraq and started killing multitudes of innocent people. I think they've overdone it in Gaza. I don't think there's any question about that. I ultimately think that the solution to that whole thing is a one state. There's no reason why Jews and Muslims and Arabs can't get along. They get along here in the United Five States. Seconds, Five seconds. I'm sorry? Five seconds. They get along here in the United States, and it, you, you could easily have that kind of system with a Jewish-controlled state, make it in the Constitution, but give the, the Palestinians equal rights as citizens within that country. All right. Um, I'm going to do this. I'd like to give everyone on the panel 45 seconds to respond to that big question. Does the audience agree or no? Yes. 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 All right. I will give everyone on the panel 45 seconds outside of their chits to uh, respond to that question. Dr. Brechtel, do you want to come back this way? Dr. Brechtel, we'll come this way. 45 seconds, please. Okay. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the, the crisis between uh, with, in the Gaza Strip uh, being perpetrated on the Gaza Strip by Israel is being abetted and enabled by the United States and its military funding, which has to be cut immediately. All funding cut. Uh, you know, the, liber the proper libertarian perspective with reference to foreign uh, a uh, countries in their uh, battles, their wars with each other, is neutrality. But that means absolutely non-interventionist uh, policies all, all around the board, absolute non-interventionism. Now, I happen to think that Israel represents a kind of peak statism, frankly. Five uh, so I don't think that, you know, in its current form that it can exist as such. It has to change. So I think it has to divest itself of a great deal of state power. Thank you. So with regards to one state solution or two state solution, here's the truth. The United States president should have any determination on whether there's one state or two state. The parties involved have to be like three from the United States government. But I'll tell you what I'm sick and tired of seeing. I'm anti-war to the core. That's what brought me to this party. And I am sick and tired of seeing our tax money being sent to fund bombs that are killing innocent kids over in Gaza. Tens of thousands of innocent kids. Now you can, the media, they harp about what Russia has done to Ukraine, but the fact is, is that Israel has killed three times as many innocent people than Russia has in Ukraine in, in terms of deaths, in terms of civilian deaths, right? So we need to be looking at this uh, and realistically and quit uh, excusing what Israel is doing. So we need to cease fire now, and of course we do need a return of hostages. They always say that, well, what about hostages? Yes, we want the hostage return, but absolutely need a ceasefire because it's unconscionable that our money is killing people in Gaza and we have to speak out against it. Thank you. I um, echo um, my colleague's sentiments there. We, we actually need to be out of foreign wars all over the world. We are using American dollars and American um, influence um, to fund these wars, and, and it's just, it, it's crazy to me. I, I want to take those dollars that are used in these wars around the world and bring those dollars back home and use them to make America better. I think the Israel um, crisis, and, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a humanitarian disaster at this point. I think somebody has to put on their big boy draws and say, hey, let's sit down, let's talk. Let's stop killing one another, let's talk. The other part of this that, that a lot of people don't, really think about you is I, I believe this is all part of a biblical type thing and that whole thing like that and I, I believe that and and I, I just think they've just got to sit down and talk. Thank you. First off, I'm always on the side of less death. And I want to find and I want to find peace, not war. We are thirty-four trillion dollars in debt. The United States government cannot afford to give money to anyone. We're broke. We're broke. We can't even take care of our own people. We cannot police Detroit. We cannot police San Francisco. How the hell are we supposed to police around the world? 
We do a horrible job. Our government does a horrible job picking winners and losers. It took us 20 years to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. <laughs> We pick one regime and then we replace it with another one. And we kill off people left and right. I don't want to be involved in that anymore. I don't want my tax dollars and I don't want my debt going to kill children in faraway lands. We've got to stop this, bring our troops home, end our uh, colonialism. I think, everyone, I think everyone echoes the same. Um, right now we can't even take care of our own country. We're supposed to be a beacon. Look at the Statue of Liberty. People should want to come to this country. Yet, we continue to make enemies. After the Ottoman Empire fall, right, we didn't draw these lines. This was a France and England problem. Now we're, we're, we're basically cleaning up, right? Why are we the policemen of the world? We've been living in World War II, our economy post, ever since, right? It makes no sense. I agree wholeheartedly. Come down to the New World. Go to Detroit. Go out to San Francisco. Let's take care of America and our people before we start trying to espouse liberty to other countries. Our bombs and our dollars should not be going anywhere else. Thanks very much. I think that there is a difference in, in how we express ourselves on this issue. We should not be working so hard at answering your question. Here's why. We need to extricate ourselves from imposing our opinions on the Israeli government. We need to allow that government to pursue whatever foreign policy they want. We have learned the hard way that foreign aid doesn't work. However you feel about it ethically, I've got a problem with it ethically. We also need to have a problem with it empirically, objectively. It doesn't work. We've already learned we have absolutely no influence over the people that have ruled the Palestinian territories or any of the other uh, entities around the, the Middle East. We have no influence over Hezbollah. We have no influence over the Israeli government. We need to get ourselves out of this business. And for that reason, we need to be careful not to answer that question the way the White House does, with the idea that we're supposed to be opposing our solution on those people. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not simply that the, the U.S. is funding and uh, arming this, these countries. I mean, as I've said before, this represents a double map violation. We're getting robbed and then it's being used to kill people. And that is a double violation of the map. So, but it is not true that the U.S. is not involved in this policy. I mean, the, uh, the fact of the matter is Israel did spawn or support financially and otherwise, uh, and then beg Qatar, or Qatar, however you want to say it, to, uh, to continue funding Hamas. So this whole thing has been partially constructed by, by U.S. involvement because we've been given all that money, 3.5 billion a year, uh, plus, uh, plus arms, with that, you know, add in tonight. Thanks a lot. It's a real joy to be with you all. As you all know, we are running a campaign specifically in order to win. What winning looks like may be different than what you expect it to look like. What it doesn't look like is losing. If you raise your hand in this campaign and you say, oh, I can't win, I can't make it, I can't achieve the White House, I'm not going to interrupt American politics, you just remove yourself from the sport. The reason people are paying attention in 2024, the reason this is a different year than 2023 or 2025, is not because we're running a philosophy seminar here. It's because people want to know who the next president of the United States is going to be. We are running a campaign that is designed to actually compete. We have 20 professionals on our team. They're not all as wonderful as Wendy and Katrina. But we have 20 people on our team who are professional. We lean very hard in my own public service and public policy background. We're running in a very principled campaign because we believe it's the right thing to do to brand the party, and we believe it's the right thing to do to differentiate us, to put us on the map. That's why we're in it. Thanks a lot. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, New York. This has been quite an honor. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues. I think this has been a very good discussion. Um, 
I've witnessed throughout my career as a physician um, a growing great depravity of the people who in this country are most vulnerable. Um, and at some point in time, it just drove me to, to do this. I don't think right now that the common person, I don't think many of the wealthier, what one would consider wealthy, um, I, don't consider, I know the people who don't have anything are not getting a fair shake in this country. Um, currently, we have a two-party system, but I would proffer that that's actually a one-party system. Nothing gets done. Um, I had a senator in my office just the other day said, you'll never fix the immigration. It makes too much money for the parties. Good luck on that one, right? So there's something that's truly wrong in this country. And if we don't stand up for what's right, who the heck they are going to stand up, right? Um, I hope um, that this party can unify. I hope that this party can actually get behind the candidate. I think many, many of us up here uh, all get along. Um, I think we get along regardless of being on stage and, and competing against one another. Uh, I think this party holds a tremendous promise, uh, but the messaging needs to be correct. Um, I just hope uh, that this fall, that everyone can unify, we can bring our dollars together, we can support whoever it is that this party chooses, and actually make a good decision, and actually make some positive outcomes in the United States of America. Thank you. You have two and a half minutes. Let's go. All right. Thank you very much. The Libertarian Party has a messaging problem. The way that I found, I started voting early on, I voted for Ross Perot because he was talking about reducing the debt. And then I voted, and then I voted for Ron Paul because he was also talking about reducing the debt and ending the Federal Reserve. And these were things that resonated with me. I didn't know I was a Libertarian, even though I had voted for Ron Paul. 2007 came along and I, there was a political quiz. I took the political quiz and I said, this will be great because I've never felt like I was a Democrat or a Republican. I took the quiz and it said I was a Libertarian. What the hell is a Libertarian? I literally had to Google what is a Libertarian. And when I did, I got to the platform and I was like, holy crap, I found my people. I found what I am. I finally am a thing. But the party still did a crap job at marketing to me and messaging to me because I didn't know that there was a party. I just registered as a libertarian and now I'm a libertarian. I didn't realize I could change things, I could do things, right? So we need to be able to get and reach the American people. I'm still being called a libtard because we have lib and libertarian. I'm still being told that we're magas who smoke dope. We are not getting our message across to the American people. We have to wake the American people up. We have to shock the American people. And the way that I intend to do this is I intend to win electoral votes on election night, something that hasn't been done since 1972 when Tony Nathan had a rogue voter vote for her. We can do this. Maine and Nebraska split their electoral vote in, into districts. We only have to win 250,000 votes to win an electoral vote on election night. This is totally achievable. I grew up really poor, and I went on to found a very large company, a Friend Finder Networks, which uh, grew to 600 employees doing $350 million a year in sales. I sold that company in 2007 for $500 million. I'm the only candidate on this stage that has the resources and the business acumen to make this happen. I need you to get on board as delegates and vote for me in Washington, D.C. so that I can put this plan into action and get national media attention for the Libertarian Party and get every American to Google what the hell is a Libertarian because I believe that's the best way to double, triple, quadruple the amount of people in this, in this room and that's the best way that we can grow the party in order to deliver freedom to the American people. Thank you. Check out 37 pieces of policy that my team has put together. I'm very proud of it. And it's uh, white papers and all. And remember, voters' bill of rights to unrig the system so that we can actually affect change. Two, two, you have two minutes. Please go ahead. First, I'd like to say thank you, New York, for, for uh, having, having us out here. Um, I listened to my colleagues, and I'm excited to, to hear what they're going to say. I think in order for us to win in this upcoming election, in fact, I believe 100% is that we have to think about this from a different perspective. Um, I, one of the things my colleague was saying was about his business. I've been in business for over 30 years. Um, my company, we raised uh, roughly $40 billion and we made an attempt to buy Warner Media before they sold to Discovery. Um, recently, we, did, we raised $3 billion and we attempted to purchase BET from Paramount Global, and we're in, we're, we are in the phases of another acquisition.
accusation. So I don't want you to think that just because I'm here, I'm just here because I'm a good looking guy and I'm the best looking of all these candidates. <laughs> but I'm here because I think that we can do something different. I've had some, you know, significant battles with the government and, um, and, and I just think that things have got to change. We've got to open the doors differently. We've got to look at our country differently and we've got to make things come together differently. When we get, when, so I, I, I want to be your president. I think I'm the candidate that can get this done. I think we win the black community with me. I think we win the Hispanic community with me. We've already got a huge agent endorsement across the nation. And that's why even in my campaigning, I've been campaigning not only inside of the Libertarian, I've been campaigning outside of the Libertarian Party as well in order to make sure that we could win um, the election overall. I think that this is our time as Libertarians. I think this is our time. I think that it's our time to stand up, to do something to different, to galvanize behind me, and let's take the White House. Thank you. Yeah. No, just got a minute, got to talk fast. Okay. Nope. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to win. I want to become the President of the United States so we can start tearing down the state brick by brick. But there's a lot of other things we can do to build this party up in this election. 60% of voters say they are willing to vote for somebody who's not Donald Trump or Joe Biden if we can give them something to vote for. And we need to bring people into the tent, just like I got brought in the tent. I was an anti-war Democrat at the time I became a libertarian because I got involved, somebody came, waved me in the room, and said, you're anti-war. Sit here with us, let's connect your anti-war views with the rest of the philosophy of liberty. And I thank God every day that that happened because it woke me up. There are people who have a libertarian issue all over the country. Are you tired of our bombs going over? overseas to kill kids, welcome home to liberty. Are you tired of seeing the immigration mess south of our border? Welcome home to liberty. Are you tired of your land being stolen by eminent domain? Welcome home to liberty. Whatever your issue is, you need to come in this tent and we are going to evangelize the message of liberty to you. That is how we grow our party up. That's what I'm committed to doing. I want to win ballot access in states just like New York. I want to win that major party status, that 2%, so you don't have to fight for ballot access anymore. And I want to grow this party up because together, if we bring people in and we welcome people into this tent, we can build up our party by the foundation while we tear down the state brick by brick. And I need you to join me in doing that along with the hundreds of volunteers we have. Go to votechaseoliver.com, join the movement, and we're going to be a 50-state party not just in the name, but on the ballot right here in New York City. In New York City. No, I do not. One man, please, sir. Thank you, and uh, it's great to be here. This was very lively. I want to say that uh, I'm the only person on the stage here that's, that's, going to, that's doing something uh, that is more in a, than a campaign. This is a movement. Uh, this is a movement that I'm trying to get people behind. This is a movement for real liberty now. It's a movement for decentralization and local control. It's a movement that has to be very bold in its messaging. We are not going to get any attention by talking about how we need to have a smaller government and things like this. This excites literally no one. We need to have a message that is bold, that's completely against the state, that is not apologetic about that. That's how we get attention. That's how we win votes. This is how we move minds. That's what we have to do, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. How many chips remaining? Ten. Ten? That'd be a long night for us. Two. Two. Okay, good. Two minutes, please. Thank you all very much. And Larry, thank you for an absolutely excellent job in moderating this. One point one percent three years ago. The latest presidential poll now has us at zero. There's actually a zero. If voter sentiment hasn't changed over three years in favor of vote for this party, it's not going to change over the next six or seven months. We already know the results. That's the reality. <coughs> Unless we change directions. Dramatically, completely, in the direction of our principles. I confess to you that I stand with the 99% who reject this message. That we've been putting out for 20 years now. It's a message of reform. Serfdom reform. Social security reform. Health care reform. Immigration reform. 
education reform, school vouchers, reform, reform, reform. That has become the message of this party, and I reject it. Our principles are our greatest asset. That is what can propel us to the 10 to 15 percent category in this vote, in this election. I ran for U.S. Senate in Virginia 20 years ago with this same kind of principle campaign. I secured the endorsement of one of the most prominent black ministers in this country, John O. Peterson. He got elected to the African American Hall of Fame. And I went in there and I said, I want to open the borders. I want to abolish Social Security and Medicare and the entire welfare state. I want to legalize all drugs because the drug war is the most racist government programs in segregation. I want to end public schooling. He said, Mr. Hornberger, I'm going to endorse your candidacy and I want you to take this letter of endorsement to every black minister in this state. And I did, and I got 7% of the statewide vote. Not 0.07, 7%. And that constituency is out there. Our principles are our greatest asset. Our job is to lead America to freedom. And the way we do that is by making the case for freedom. And that's how we lead the world to freedom. Excellent. Everybody, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you all for your questions.